Hello and welcome to the THC Show. I'm your host Neil Magnuson and this is the show where we talk about the truths in our world, uh, some of the reasons for uh, being upset about things, and uh, that there's some hope about what to do about those things and we also try to find some ways to change things and that's kind of what we've been working on for a while here. On the show today we'll have 8 out of 10 Glenn from Canamatch.ca join us for the 420 session. Uh, Jerry Martin will be here uh, to talk about his journey uh, through the courts now to figure out what's going on with him and his low barrier access dispensaries or medical dispensaries and, uh, and that whole situation. And uh, we'll be visiting the RV uh, where the CSP and the Healing Wave do their thing uh, as always. People do drugs. Almost everybody does drugs. Drugs come in many different forms. Not only people do drugs, animals do drugs too. It seems there's quite a desire amongst the living creatures to either fix their problems or have an adventure or just change things. But people do drugs. Cats use catnip. Dolphins use puffer fish. You know what they do? They, they grab the puffer fish, which emits this poisonous uh, uh, plume. They take a few puffs of it and they squeeze it a little bit to get the plumes out. And then they pass it off to their dolphin friends who do the same thing. It's sort of like standing around or in a circle and passing a joint around. But dolphins use puffer fish to get high. Um, they can be lethal, puffer fish. So they have to be very careful about how they do it. Dolphins are quite skilled about how much of the poison they take in. Just enough to give them that change in their, their thinking and their change in their mood that they're looking for. I doubt that they're doing it to use it for medical reasons. They're probably not feeling bad, and puffer fish will make them feel better. But, you know, maybe they just want to feel different and, uh, and have a little bit of fun, and that's why they use it. Uh, we got uh, cows that uh, eat local weed. We've got deers that eat mushrooms and all kinds of... There, there's, um, what are they, uh, bighorn sheep that uh, will go to great lengths and, and risk their lives to go into dangerous areas where these particular lichen grow. And then they, they use their teeth to, to peel off or chew off or get off the lichen to the point where, in many cases, their teeth are worn right down over time. And all of that is hallucinogenic. There's uh, wallabies in, uh, in Australia that use opium and love the opium. Uh, there's, uh, who, who uses the Animascara? That's the, um, well, that's the deer and the, mush, and the moose and the caribou. They like the uh, Animanita mascara, mush, mascara mushrooms. And so people use drugs for all kinds of different reasons, and that's okay. Uh, sometimes it's a problem. Sometimes it's a problem in the animal world. Uh, a lot of animals like alcohol. Uh, bees like alcohol once in a while. There's, they don't have a big alcohol problem amongst the bee population, but there is some. And, and what they do is when, when some of their bee friends are arriving drunk too often, you can get away with it a few times, but if you're c coming drunk too often and you can't really wiggle your bum and tell everybody where the, the flowers are, then they will attack the bee, they will rip off the, the wings and the feet, and they will kill them. Uh, there can be problems. Uh, like I say, the puffer fish are poisonous. Maybe some dolphins die sometimes. Maybe that's how they learned to be careful. Probably they did. It's, it's all about life's journey. It's all about uh, being a human being or being some sort of a, a life form that's been born into an environment and now you're trying to live your life and do your thing and that's just part of it. Uh, drugs are part of our environment. They come, like I say, in many, many different forms. Uh, and then again, it depends on what your definition of a drug is. Some people think weed is not a drug, but you know, I think maybe it depends on the definition and probably a definition of a drug would be something that alters your mood or your consciousness or your thoughts uh, by ingestion or by exposure. But uh, love is a drug and chocolate is a drug and then certainly white refined sugar is a drug. I mean look at the effect it has on on kids that get into too much of it and how hyper they get and all of those things. There's just drugs all over the place and, and we need drugs for many different things and we desire drugs for many different reasons and that's just life. That's what life is all about. It's a part of life especially if you're hurting. Uh, if you're hurting, man, there's such a huge variety of things that you can go and find for yourself to help you. There's uh, all kinds of stuff. I and mean, I'm not going to start listing off a whole list. We all know that there is just hundreds and hundreds of items that are available in drug stores, natural food stores, uh, other places that are remedies, that are, that are cures, that are, are ways to deal with symptoms. There's just a ton of different things, and they're all basically drugs to some degree. It's just a pursuit of health. 
when you stop being healthy. Uh, for some, it starts right at birth. They're not healthy to begin with, and their whole life is involved in trying to find things that will ease their, their pain or help them get through whatever they need to get through and, and all of that. And so drugs are a natural part of just being alive. And so here we have this mess that's going on. And I'll tell you, it is a mess. It is a huge mess. It is a costly, expensive, violent, deadly mess. And it's all because some people have decided that they're going to try to control the drug intakes of other people. And this has been going on for a long, long time. And it has caused nothing but trouble. It just never works. It never works to try to force somebody away from trying something that they want to try. It doesn't work. Human beings and probably most living entities don't like being forced. They don't like being told they can't do something. And, and so this has just caused this huge mess because the attempt to prohibit drugs causes an increase in the use of those drugs. It causes a huge increase in the problematic use of those drugs. Just about any drug can cause problems. Just about any person could get themselves into trouble by becoming too used to using certain drugs. I mean, you know, I don't like to use the word addiction. Uh, it's a controversial word. But for sure, some people's pursuit of drugs is not done in a way that is helpful to them. Not everybody finds drugs that helps them with their medical conditions. Some people find drugs that cause medical conditions. And so there are issues with drugs. There's a whole variety of drugs, as I mentioned. Um, in, the, in the field of mushrooms, for example, there is a whole bunch of mushrooms that could be considered drugs and that are useful and can be used for different things. And there's a whole bunch that are completely poisonous and they're not food and, and we can't use them and we need to leave them alone. But there's just a huge range of those. There's a huge range of other flowers and plants and things that have compounds within them that have effects on, on living organisms. And so we pursue those things and we do those things. But when when someone comes along that isn't your, your parent, and even if it's your parent, my God, most of us don't even take their advice very well. We certainly don't take their telling us what we can and cannot do very well. But certainly when other people come along and start to tell you that you can't have something, it causes people to immediately want that thing. It doesn't cause you to say, oh, okay, yeah, oh, well, this person doesn't think I, he's this group or this king or this preacher or, you know, this person, police officer, doctor, whoever it might be, says, you know, you can't have this. Well, I'm just not going to have that then. I'll just trust them that they're right and they know what's best for me. And, and so, no, it doesn't work that way. It, it might work that way with some people, but it doesn't work that way with a whole bunch of people. In fact, it has the opposite effect, as I mentioned. So people go about and find drugs that they wouldn't even otherwise have thought about, except that some government or some group has said, oh, well, you can't have these things. These things are dangerous. As soon as you say it's dangerous, now you've got a whole population of people that are interested in that because they're, they live for danger. They defy danger. So it just doesn't work. And it hasn't worked for a long, long time. And now we're in a situation where we've got such a horrible mess going on that we've got to do something about it. We can't just be sitting idly by and going, well, the world's a mess. There's a whole bunch of people dying from a poisoned uh, opioid supply. And, and there's a whole bunch of people in jail because they decided they were going to use a herb even though the government said they couldn't use a herb. And, uh, you know, you, you, you can't just sit by anymore. It's, it's just too much. This is too important. This is a huge, huge crime that's going on. It is, it, is, it is a wonderful thing that it's going on like this because it gets to show us the world that we're living in. It gets to give us a, a benchmark, a, a, a starting point, a, a point of view that will expose what's right and what's wrong in our lives and in the society that we live in. We're making a lot of choices for ourselves. That's the whole trick of life is choice moment by moment. What are you going to choose? What are you going to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to sleep? Do you want to eat? Do you want to do some weed? Do you want to do some of this? What do you want to do? Do you want to exercise? That's a personal thing. But we live in a society where they're saying do this and don't do that and do this and don't do that. And society puts a whole bunch of pressures on people to do and don't do things. And much of it is against a person's own natural will of what they would and otherwise wouldn't do. And really, the, the problem is, is that it's not the role of government. It's not the role of doctors. It's not the role of police. It's not the role of kings and queens. It's not the role of anybody 
to dictate what you as a human being do and don't do in your life. And like I say, as soon as they start doing that, it just starts messing stuff up. So when I say it's a crime, a crime is a particular thing. It's not having some herb that you thought might help you feel better. A crime requires the intent to cause damage and the damage actually done. Uh, mens rea and actus rea, the two main components of a crime. And I say it's a crime that our governments have imposed prohibitions and now ridiculous restrictions on, uh, on cannabis, as an example, because it's causing an awful lot of damage, very, very significant damage, even just in the expenditure of our precious tax dollars that go into police resources and other resources to try to prevent people from growing plants or trading in plants or using plants. That's a huge destructive cost to us because we don't have enough tax dollars to deal with all of the important things in our life. In the next uh, few months coming up, we're going to be witnessing governments talking about how they're going to have to hold back services. They're going to have to cut services. They're going to have to, you know, try to save some money at our expense and at the expense of the people that really need it because now they're in this economic crisis because, well, not only have they spent billions of dollars trying to enforce a law that they can't enforce, but because we've had a pandemic that's, that's caused the governments to decide to spend enormous amounts of money to try to keep people calm and not rioting in the streets uh, due to the, the restrictions they're imposing with the pandemic. They're bribing everybody to go along with it at huge expense of our tax dollars. But it's not just about money. This is about human lives. This is about people who, who have their lives ruined by government policy, by governments trying to dictate what you can and cannot do with respect to which drugs you want to take. The whole war on drugs and, and the, the attempt by governments to uh, annihilate certain drugs in favor of other drugs is so destructive to human lives. And it's the destructive part that is the big part of whether or not it's a crime. If you're a criminal, there's different levels of crime that you can commit because there's different levels of damage that you can cause. And how heinous the crime is, is based on how much damage you do and, and how serious that damage is. Well, we're talking about ruining human beings' lives. We're talking about locking people up in cages for choosing to do certain drugs or to be involved in helping people get the drugs that they demand. Because if there's going to be a prohibition on drugs, there's going to be a, a huge increase in the demand for drugs. And if there's a demand for drugs, there will be a supply of drugs. There has to be. That's how it works. Somebody is going to be desperate enough, poor enough, or greedy enough to put some price on providing that which is demanded. That's a natural law that cannot be overcome by any man-made rules or laws. Supply and demand is a real law. When you have a huge demand for something and people with money to spend on it, you will have a supply of that thing. It's guaranteed. So all the government does by prohibiting drugs is guarantee that some of the young, rebellious, poor, distraught people, and some of the greedy ones too, are going to try to take advantage, make a huge amount of dollars for themselves in a short period of time, and supply the drugs that people are demanding because somebody's going to do it. So the government is deciding that a certain percentage of our population are going to be involved in the illegal drug trade as soon as they decide to make drugs illegal. That's a conscious decision that they make. And it could be your children. It could have been you. It could be anybody. But somebody's going to do it because supply and demand is a real thing. So there's huge damage being done in the attempt to prohibit people from accessing cannabis and other drugs that the government deems that they're going to make illegal for you. And that amount of damage done makes it an extremely heinous crime. Justice is determined by an older matriarch holding a set of scales on which on one side is placed the amount of damage that is done and on the other side a penalty to balance the scale. How much damage is done when a government decides to prohibit a particular plant that people are already using 
and are now going to want to use even more because they're going to decide to prohibit it. The damage is so incredible that the penalty could never match it. And then there's the other side of whether it's a crime. Do they know what they're doing? Do they understand that, that what they're doing is going to cause damage? Well, we probably have to have a court case to decide whether or not they did or didn't know and when they knew what and who knew what and what have you. But I'm here to tell you they've known for a long time. They, because it's clear as can be. Anybody that does their due diligence and looks into it would know that cannabis doesn't deserve to have the criminal law used against anybody that would grow it or supply it. That's ludicrous. There's no damage being done to anybody. There's no harm being caused to our society by people wanting to use this plant. The reason the government decided to prohibit it was to satisfy supporters and people that got them into power that wanted to capitalize on making money on the substitutes for cannabis. You look at the history, it's plain as day. It is plain as can be. A child could figure out that no way should the government have ever have pro prohibited this amazing plant that will help a person sleep, it will help with pain, it will help with anxiety, it improves your mood. All the things that, that your human body requires for its own well-being can be found in the cannabis plant because it mimics our endocannabinoid system. Even a child could understand that nobody should come along and tell some adult that they can't even have this plant to use for their own benefit. That's not right. So we find ourselves in the midst of a horrible, horrible mess. It's 419. We're about to get out of the mess because of the 420 session. But we can get out of the mess some other ways too. We can work to stop government's abuse of power. We can work to have governments that will limit the powers that they have, that will understand that they need to be transparent in their actions, and that they should be accountable for what they do when they commit crimes. When they decide to prohibit a plant to satisfy the, the people that got them into power so that they can sell you alcohol and pharmaceuticals and, and fossil fuel gasoline and all these other things that, that cause the, the prohibition of cannabis, that they need to be held accountable for that. So if we had accountable, transparent, limited public servants that understood that their job was to protect us individuals to be able to live our lives and choose whatever we want for ourselves, and it's, if we want it, it'll be available to us, then we'll have a much better world. And that's what I'm hoping we can get somewhere down the road, and that's what this show is about, and that's what we're trying to do. But right now it's a mess, and it's a mess because governments are are trying to decide for you what you can and cannot put into your body, what you should and should not be thinking about, what type of a mood you should be in, whether you should be able to deal with your pain and the other things and the other problems that we have, or whether you should be able to just have an adventure, smoke some weed and laugh your guts out for an hour or two. That's what we need to do, is get governments that respect our right to be able to be ourselves and live our lives without them getting involved and telling us that we can't have cannabis. <laughs> it seems so ridiculous. I can't even believe I'm still uttering the words. But that's the world we're living in, and this is the world we got to get out of. And we need to get out of it because it's costing us a whole lot. It's ruining a lot of people's lives. It's harming our society. Uh, and it'll probably harm you if it hasn't already. So that's what the show is about. We're going to get to more of that in a little bit. But right now it's uh, 420. It says so right there. <laughs> And uh, Glenn Wells is with me. Boy, I timed that right, oh, eh? Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> it was a really close. Really close, yeah. <laughs> so, 8 out of 10, Glenn. How are you doing, Good, sir? how are you? Good to see you're wearing the shirt there from yeah, Best Buds Society. Yeah, Best Buds, yeah. And uh, I, I got my tattoo yesterday. Woo! Gazoo! Sal, Sal. You, know, you haven't seen this yet, but there you go. There's Gazoo, or Gazoo. The Great Gazoo. The Great Gazoo. Yeah, that was done at... There uh, are other gazoos, but this is the great one. Devil Tattoos, Studios, and Mission. So, and he did it for free because I saw happy birthday to his mom. Right there. There you are, right? So, yeah, they got that yesterday. And there's a new medical site. Uh, right. Online, uh, it's the Cannabis... Canada, Canadian, cannabis, Canadian Cannabis. Canadian Cannabis. Cannabis Center. Dot com. Yep. Yeah, they, and you can uh, go and, uh, and get weed from there. You can uh, order weed from there. Yeah. Uh, I would just suggest that you uh, read the deal very carefully, read the fine print very carefully. Yeah. But uh, that's, a, that's a place to access good, uh, good herbs. And so. you're smoking the Fruit Loops today? I was. Where did I put that? I don't know. I've got the Pink Anxiety right here. And it was, it was very fragrant when I uh, cut it open. What about yours? 
I thought it smelled really good. They smell really I got good. The, eh? I got the Fruit Loops. I put the link up there if anybody wants to check it out. Uh, Make sure you read the, the, what they say, though. Yeah. It, you got to read the instructions. <laughs> you got to read what they say. But it's a good place to access herb, and that's the main thing. And it's for medical people, too, and it's not government prices. So, uh, Aren't we all medical people? Is yes. There, is there a yeah. non-medical person? Well, the, the, what the, would a non-medical person The government be? thinks there's a non-medical, even though smoking pot is good for your well, they body. Well, they think that there's non-medical thing. weed, yes. and, I, and I would argue that one, too. <laughs> but a non-medical person? I don't know about that. <laughs> so I think I, you're medical. I think we're all medical. So happy 420, everybody. And I don't think you can help, but... but help your own medical condition, whatever it may be, <laughs> by using cannabis. Yeah. So, and he, he did a good job on the eyes, too. He's all stoned in the eyes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Red eye going on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I look forward to seeing it when it's not covered in tape. Yes, it's, a, it's actually a medicine um, stuff that they put on there. It helps keep the color in. Uh, in of your skin. Yeah, for your four day or three days or whatever it is. If it helps, it's medicine. Yeah. I'm not itchy. I'm the, not I like the indigenous uh, definition of medicine uh, that goes yeah. back in North America a long ways back. It said anything good. Yeah, anything good. Anything. Medicine is anything good. <laughs> anything good. Oh, uh, just yeah. you have you have your even keel, and then you have things that are not so good, and then you have things that are good. So whenever you're wherever you're at, wherever that is, that's your even keel. Now, if you find something else that's better. Or helps, and that's good. That's even better. So you can always find something good, and it's always medical. Well, Douglas is having fun with his new phone. <laughs> Just a side note for all, all you people who don't know Douglas. Yeah. Hi, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> what does he say? Come on. Okay. He's, He's got a little picture of a girl and a boy, and he goes, stupid new phone. <laughs> One of the things I've texted a lot into my phone over the years. Yes. Stupid autocorrect. Yes. No. Oh, and if you try to use the voice to text, it doesn't use the right words. Oh, something. is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, you uh, always come uh, through clear as a bell for me. No, I mean, like, you're. Oh, doing if you your, wanted to. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, I, I think that would take words. Like, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. You say that, and he'll say. spell it for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you have to spell it yourself, right? <laughs> but, yeah. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. There you go. Talking about drugs. Yeah, there Talking you go. about drugs right there. <laughs> Everything is a drug. And, and, and with drugs, you know, there's no good or bad drugs. No. A drug is just, this is a drug. If this is a drug, there it is. But do something. Who, who, be good. Be good. Be who, bad. Do something. Who's not doing nothing? It won't do nothing because it isn't either good or bad. There's nothing good or bad about this thing that we call a drug. Yeah. What there is okay. is good and bad relationships with these things that we call drugs. And and that's the thing of it. You know, you, but any drug, if it's a drug, yeah. if it's a powerful, powerful drug, it's got a place. It's got a use somewhere. If it's an extremely mild drug. It's got a place. Well, it's why got would you a just use. call it a medicine instead of a drug? Well, you could do that. Drug has such a well because a, because a, if, if medicine if medicine is anything good, yes, drugs are not always good. Drugs themselves are neither good nor bad. I just but said that. They're just yeah. but the relationship with that drug could be bad. Yeah. So that uh, you know, if you're in a state of, of need of some sort, and you think this might help you, yeah, and you go ahead and use it, and maybe it doesn't, yeah, you know. Uh, I've got but examples of that. Things I've tried that have made things worse. A medicine? It's, it well, means the same, but it's not such... A like nice I say, thing. if medicine is anything good, yes. I don't think that you can say that a drug is good or bad. Okay. Drugs are not good or bad. They are just entities that have potentials. I just use the word medicine because a medicine man has been around for such a long Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Drugs right? can be used as yes. medicine. We never called them a drug man. Right? Oh, for right? sure. Or the medicine lady of the of the tribe or something like that, right? So it's always a medicine, not a drug, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. absolutely drugs are yeah. medicine. Yeah, I think that's but more But they're not it. always medicine in the form of this is going to help you. Yeah. Uh, you know, some drugs won't help your condition. Some drugs will probably kill you. I mean, you know, a drug that could save someone, a person's yeah. life here, could, be could kill somebody else there. Could have so, you know, yeah. it's not inherently good. Uh, it is what it is, but it absolutely is good lots of times. Yes. You know? Yeah. I mean, in many, many cases, these are drugs. Uh, cannabis, and, and I've said this, this can't help, really, if, if ingested, yeah. but be a medicine, or but be yes. good. It really doesn't do any harm no. to anybody. No. Um, th nothing that we've been able to find. fiber in it for you, and all kinds of, if you were to eat it. Yeah, if you were to eat, you it. eat it. I didn't think you got fiber when you're smoking it. <laughs> no, no fiber when you're smoking it, no. But you get those cannabinoids that are attaching to that certain receptor in your lungs. 
preventing that certain disease. <laughs> so maybe when you're inhaling the vapors from burning cannabis, there's a potential there for the carbon yeah. that isn't the, the cannabinoids. Yeah. Like the cannabinoids, they pretty much melt with the heat. Yeah. They release their, their magical vapors with the heat. Yeah. But within there, if it's not a, a really good, well-made, clean concentrate, then there's plant matter. Yeah. And other times there's fertilizers or pesticides or other things yeah. that have been incorporated into, in fact, cannabis uh, leaches from the soil all kinds of things. So yeah. especially if it's grown outdoors, there could be some other impurities in, in, the, in, the, in, the, plant, in the plant matter. Plant, yeah. So not really the most healthy way, perhaps, to ingest cannabis through yeah. smoking the plant matter, you know, along yeah. with the cannabinoids. But there's been no significant harm. No, because forever. can you put a, a cannabis plant in a radioactive field and it would be able to, to take care it of the would. soil? It now does. Now you'd be able to smoke that. Well, that's the question. Is well, Does that cannabis then transfer that radioactivity into the, the, uh, oh, the, the plant know. itself? We should try to, to do an experiment. We should, we should let's call go the to experts. Russia, let's go to Chernobyl. We should call the experts. Or, <laughs> or, let's go plant some hemp seeds in Chernobyl and see what happens. <laughs> or, or, or I should already know this by now. You know, basically, I feel that should yeah. be the case. Uh, well, I bet, I bet you, like, like, there's nobody, no ladies that have gone to their doctor and said, "Hey, I'm pregnant. I want to test cannabis." They probably haven't gone to a radioactive site to grow pot to test it either, right? You know, they've used cannabis yeah. uh, to uh, uh, restore the soils in places where there has been. Uh, Radioactivity and things. Yeah, but we've never checked to see um, what the bud was like. What I've never, what I've never heard. I mean, maybe nobody's ever smoked that cannabis. Yeah, I don't know, uh, but I, I know that I've not heard any reports yeah. of anybody being significantly harmed in any way by ingesting cannabis that has been you know, radioactively affected. Do they grow cannabis or do they grow hemp plants in the soil? Hemp and cannabis are the same thing. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. You, you it's the same. You it's the same plant. Hemp. No, that's not true. Oh no. Oh, I see. I we thought, covered this yeah. on last week's yeah, show. I know, I know, I know. But that, yeah, that, that was the age. myth that they yeah. told us. Yeah. They told us because they wanted to keep the teenagers out of the hemp field because they uh, were going to allow some hemp to be grown. That, oh, yes. uh, that, that case was one, and, and some brilliant activists that made that all happen back in the day. I should do a little show on that one day as well. But uh, so they, we, they did get the right to grow cannabis, hemp, mm -hmm. uh, but they had to do it like off major highways and all kinds uh, of other okay. things. But it was there and available on the other side of a ditch for yeah. anybody that wanted to go and get it. And, and this is out in very rural areas. So yeah. You don't have a lot of young people driving by yeah. it on a Friday night yeah. and going, Hey, man, look at the fields in the field. Somebody's man. growing a whole bunch of weed, it's, man. It's like that dog you know? uh, meme where he's getting stuck in the field, but he doesn't care. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they, they didn't think there'd be a lot of that anyway, but that was one of the prohibitionists' concern, is yeah. that young people would get in there and, and think that this was just regular THC marijuana. Mm -hmm. Marijuana is, is uh, not hemp. No. Hemp is not marijuana because as it turns out, when they were going to test something to see if it was marijuana, it was all about the THC content. Okay. So THC was marijuana, uh, but the rest of the cannabis plant apparently wasn't. Was uh, now they've added CBD and they probably reworded it so the whole thing is yeah. illegal. But, uh, but eight, what, they told, what they told, what I was told in my generation, and obviously yeah. you too, is that if you smoke that stuff, it'll just give you a headache. Yeah. And no, it won't oh. because it's CBD. Yeah. It's high in CBD. Okay. If you had a headache and you smoked a bunch of hemp, it would probably take your headache away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. More lies. Last week's show was all about lies. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And how many lies we've been told. And, and that's another big one. So, uh, yeah. But uh, we've also said that it's a different delta, right? It's delta 8. And so in THC, it's delta 9. So you'd have to smoke, smoke more of delta 8. To get the, the same high as your THC. I should bring on an expert, on this, an expert on this here. new whole thing, yes. the Delta 8 yes. and all of that. Uh, THC in uh, raw, uh, fresh cannabis in the flower is not uh, psychoactive. No, it's, it's not THC euphoric. A. It's THC acid. A, yes. And, uh, and so it, it needs to be uh, converted to THC Delta 9 through a, a heat process, and that's why you burn it. Uh, or cook it, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. So anyway, I'm not sure why we're even talking about well, that now. Well, this is session. Session. Yeah, we're talking about weed, right? We're gonna talk about anything until Jerry gets it. That's <laughs> what we're do. But my doctor says THCA is good for you. I it, think it is good for yes, you. Yes, it is very good for you. Yep. So like your smoothie in the morning, you can have THCA, not get high, and you're gonna get all the benefits of this stuff 
but not get high. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So if you're growing plants, and we should all be growing plants, everybody should be growing plants, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, you should be juicing your leaves. That's what I highly recommend. It's a very, very helpful thing to do is take the leaves as you would be picking them off and what have you and just throw them in a blender and juice them with apples and grapes and pears and all the other things you'd throw into like a fruit smoothie or something like that. And it's fantastic and yeah. it's super, super oh, it's healthy. It's really good for you. Yeah, really, really good for you. It, uh, yeah, even taking the oils has helped me lose over 30 pounds because I'm not... Uh, I'm, I'm not craving sugar as much anymore. My body's a lot healthier and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, cannabis is a it, it, it helps the endocannabinoid system, which yeah. is the system that balances all of the other systems in the body. Yeah. So I mean, most uh, chronic weed smokers you'll find are in in fairly good shape. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the way I'm getting there. Getting, <laughs> there. getting there. Yeah. yeah. Very good. All right, Glenn, that was great. Uh, we All did right. it. We had another one. Yeah. Uh, I think that's 90 now, although you might nope. have missed a couple. Yeah, we so 88. Yeah. yeah, 88 for you, but, yeah. you know, you're here on the but 90th show. I'm definitely going to bring you a cake for the 100. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 right. I thought about that last night. i got to have a special 100 cake. We'll be doing some special things for 100. Maybe we'll have a bunch of different guests. Uh, maybe by that we'll, time, maybe we'll have a bunch of different guests. Old stuff or whatever. We'll maybe see. Maybe we'll, we'll go to the right. studio for that. We'll see. It's, it's fairly <laughs> close. We're just like a couple we're, months away. We're, uh, yeah, two and a half months. Yeah, two. Uh, uh, eight, ten shows. Ten Thank shows. Good night, ninety right now. Yep. Very All right. Good. Sounds good. Oh, well, it's always good to have a four twenty session, isn't it? So, on the next sec section of the show, this is the uh, the Martin Medical moment. Uh, it's the moment on the show where we, we discuss what's going on with the whole idea of having medical cannabis stores. The government has uh, implemented a legalization system that. Uh, that doesn't include uh, medical users. Uh, the medical users have been completely thrown under the bus. And uh, for a long time there, we had medical dispensaries that had opened, uh, you know, right in plain view with signage and, and trying to follow proper protocols that would go along with whatever government policies might follow one day. And so we had all these medical dispensaries that were helping people in their community. And, and each dispensary had like thousands of members. There was about 180 of those in Vancouver. And there was some also across the country that were popping up and helping people. And one of those was the, uh, the, the Martin Medical Clinic. And, and Jerry Martin ran that. And he ran that for four years uh, before Trudeau got into power and said that he was going to legalize cannabis and that the medical users would be fine. Except that Jerry got a notice like so many other dispensaries got, telling him that he had to cease and desist his operations. That's an impossible thing to, to do. You're talking to somebody in the first place who's been running an illegal dispensary for whatever time they've been running it for, but mostly because in doing that, they're dealing with patients who are so over-the-top happy that they can finally get access to something that really helps them in profound ways. And these are people that are dealing with serious medical issues that there's no way any human being would turn their back on those people. Not even a criminal, not even a real criminal, not somebody who's helping people get weak. But nobody would turn their back on, on people that are suffering and in need. And you've been helping them for a while. And now you're told to quit doing that. So you're going to keep doing what you were doing, which is continue to be an illegal dispensary until they legalize it and figure shit out and get the truth happening. And then we get to be a, a mainstream store. And that's what Jerry did. But unfortunately, they clamped down on him and they came and arrested him and seized a bunch of his property and shit. And he's been on uh, an over four years, I think it's four and a half years now, that he's been in this journey since that happened to try to get justice in the courts. And uh, let's bring him in and talk to him a little bit about what's going on with himself and, and that journey. Come on in, Jerry. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hope you're doing okay despite uh, life's challenges. Oh yeah, there's always Jesus. challenges. Always, eh? Yeah. It's one after the other, it seems. Yeah. You know, <laughs> always, yeah. not you just, and I know it's yeah. you in particular for some <laughs> strange reason, yeah. but uh, everybody has that kind of going on, I think, where uh, you just kind of get over one, yeah. you know, I don't know what to call them. I was going to say obstacles, but that doesn't yeah. really, really state, yeah. you know, the, the, the stuff that life puts us through. So, and you've been through a lot. Uh, it's been uh, over eight years since you opened your dispensary and uh, went through a lot of stuff to have that happen. And then yeah. now over four, four years, I get what, four, November, right? Over four and a half. Now. Over four and a half yeah. now, because of last November. Yeah. And you've had a day in court. Yeah. You got to, you got to say your piece. Uh, but we can't talk about that because there's a publication ban. So we really can't say much about that other than that uh, you did get to, to have your day in court. Uh, and uh, as, as well did uh, your other co-defendants and some witnesses as their affidavits were uh, cross-examined uh, through a, an audio for us, but an audio-video thing for you. 
and uh, and you feel okay about that, but we don't yeah. know. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Uh, Laura's gonna ask for my car and my building back tomorrow. Nice. We'll see how that goes. See how it goes anyway. Ask for house and maybe get one. <laughs> <laughs> ask for more. Ask for yeah. compensation. Plus your life car. Start after five years sitting there. <laughs> and, like seize up after a while. I don't know. <laughs> You would hope they'd been starting it every once in a while. Oh, yeah. that's what I was hoping. Yeah. Where is it? In an impound lot. Impound, yeah, inside. It's, it's in an impound. Oh, inside. Yeah, an they kept lot. my cars inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was nice. Although I don't yeah. think they considered them your cars anymore. Yeah, no, the one's gone. Yeah, and the Probably, Tahoe's gone. They kept them inside for their own purposes. Well, that's it. they want to make sure they're in good shape. <laughs> yeah, that's they, right. When, when they, they, they sell them. your car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. man. So you got other things going on. You haven't uh, you haven't just stopped in your life. No. Uh, you were always about uh, helping people, and you got uh, this project you've been working on for a couple of years now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's about the freedom of thought for yeah. the most part, and access to uh, to plant medicines and right. to drugs. This this show's been about yeah. drugs. You didn't see the opening, but yeah. we talked a lot about people doing drugs and the drugs yeah. that are available and what they all are about and stuff. Yeah. There's all kinds and, of good ones. And there's all kinds of good ones. And in yeah. fact, I did mention that there's. Uh, there's, there's long, long-horned uh, sheep up in the mountains, or goats, that, that go around and, and find the lichen, and they scrape it off with their teeth, and uh -huh. they get a real hallucinogenic yeah, yeah. effect off of that. And same with the deer and the moose that are eating uh, all kinds of psychedelic mushrooms. Yeah. And it's those psychedelics that you're involved with, because that's a whole other... I mean, cannabis has psychoactive effects, but it's not a psychedelic. Right, so it's kind of listed in the psychedelic category. Is it? Yeah. I mean, some, it can be. I mean, yeah, you can, you can, can you know. consume enough hash, yeah. I mean, and edibles for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I you know, heard, psychedelics yeah. have different... Yeah, if different you ingest things, cannabis you know. in the right form, in the right way, it is hallucinogenic. Yeah, it, it does alter your mind, right? So, it's true. Yeah. And, and therein lies the, the yeah. crux of it all. It yeah. alters your mind. Yeah. Right? So here are these substances that are available in our environment that alter our mind, and some people want to do that. You say a psychedelic, but not a hallucinogenic. Totally different. I would argue that even cannabis can be hallucinogenic. Well, you uh, if you eat too much edibles, yeah, I've done sure, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, seen, I've seen lots of colors yeah. dancing around yeah. and uh, lots yeah. of things. Um, not, not maybe as hallucinogenic as, say, LSD or some of these, uh, right. you know, the con uh, BMT. Yeah, and they're all different types of uh, hallucinogenic. And, and probably every little well, not, And I don't even think DMT is hallucinations. It's that's an argument that could yeah, be made too. It's your it's yourself you're seeing. Well, right? wouldn't your they all be yourself? And, <laughs> yeah, your past DNA. Yeah, you know all that family histories uh, stored in there, right? Well, hallucinogenic yeah. doesn't mean that it's projecting an image on a screen that you're watching. No, it means no, that you're it's, experiencing it's here, this. Yeah. Inside your head. I wear head. a mindfold when it's I do my psychedelics, you know, experiences. You wear a blindfold, yeah? A mindfold, yeah. A mindfold. Yeah, yeah. What's a mindfold? Uh, it's just an eye mask. Okay. It's a nice comfy one, and yeah, it's padding. <laughs> and, yeah. Do, you, do you find yourself focusing on it at all when you're having your trip? Oh, no. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. The trip no. is on other it things. It usually comes off out with <laughs> it. Nice. But I'm in another world, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah. 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 Uh, these are amazing yeah. compounds yeah. In, our, in our world here. Uh, these are things that have been discovered over time in many different ways. Uh, probably hallucinogenics were discovered by human creatures, you know, thousands and thousands, millennia ago. Yeah, I don't yeah, even know. Sure. But uh, some of them are are profound as can be, at least according to the experience. Yeah, changing for sure. Yeah, the experiencer will tell you in many cases that the the, the profound effect of how. It changed their life in so many ways, and, yeah. and and people that are struggling with addiction have, have you know all of a sudden been able to shake their addiction, yeah. and people that had childhood traumas have been able to deal with their childhood yeah, traumas. And people going to death. Uh, and, you know, they, yeah, they, they, they put some experience. enemies going to the other side, right? All of these things, yeah. and and they're never the same for any per, any two people, I would yeah. imagine. No, every experience and every every individual for, individual experience. Yeah, every experience I have is totally different. Uh, it can be uh, similar. Uh, sometimes there's stages you got to work through, right? And you can get stuck. Is that in dependent that. on the substance or dependent uh, on the time? I would say probably not so much on the substance, but what you got to deal with you inside deal with. because that's right. what you're doing it for, right? You yeah. know, uh, I've yeah. heard uh, so you got to work through that shit before you can move on and deal with the new shit. I've heard it described that uh, psilocybin, for example, and I'm sure many, many others, uh, cause a reset yeah. of, uh, of many different functions of the brain and, and things like that. Sure, and it grows new, new brain pathways. 
helps for alertness and uh, yeah. memory and yeah. many different things. It shuts down your default mode network so you can think from outside the box. Right. right? Yeah. And, and so there becomes the crux of our question today, and that is about uh, thinking outside the box. Yeah. Uh, people want to think outside the box, but yet here we have what call themselves authorities, leaders, um, elected officials is what they really are, public servants is what I like to call them. But they have for quite a while now been involved in telling people that, uh, you know, you can have these substances that will alter your consciousness and you can't have these substances that will alter your consciousness. And, and so this, and, and yet we've allowed that because, I mean, allowed it. We come from people that have been exploited by kings and queens and dictators and tyrants for thousands of years. We have not been free as people ever. We are not free now. We are free to obey the dictates of our prime minister and whoever is the next prime minister. Uh, but we are not free, and this is the best and biggest example of that. And that's why I say now we're back to the crux of what we're talking about today and what you've been talking about. And that is, is that there are all of these substances. People want to try them in many cases, and, and, and they need to try them in many cases. They've got issues going on. They've got desires. They're just living beings that want to experience. And here we have governments that have decided that you can't have a whole bunch of these things that could help you dramatically. And, and even if they harm people in serious ways in some cases, that's not a role of government to be able to say you can't buy that. In fact, all the things that they tell you that you're allowed to have, these incredibly toxic synthetic pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. that the medical profession, you know, at, at the behest of the government, are willing to hand out willy-nilly to just about anybody that, oh, yeah. that, that claims they got anything wrong yeah. with them. And if they kill somebody, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and, and, and they are the profiteers on the trading of alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol kills hundreds of people from alcohol poisoning every month in British Columbia. Nobody ever talks about that. No. You know, that's a, that's a huge problem. Not to mention all the collateral damage from people that are, you know, using alcohol in ways that are not healthy and certainly not healthy for society. And we all know about, you know, so many problems of, of domestic abuse and so much more tragedies on the highways and all these things. And yet the governments are the profiteers. On, on supplying alcohol to people, complete with advertisements and glorification and fancy stores and fancy labeling and all of that stuff. Uh, you know, it's just insane. It is absolutely insane that we will, as human beings, put up with this. We must be fast asleep to be, to be okay in a world where there's a guy with a gun and a badge who's going to grab you and put you in a fucking cell where they might not let you out for years because you've got some plants going on. I know uh, Adela Wisdom in the States there is going through this, this issue where there was some wild cannabis plants growing on her, on her property. And she's, she's facing jail time for that in a very strict jurisdiction. There's people in half a dozen countries around the world that are being executed. Many of them have been oh, executed. Yeah for like 50 grams of, of herbal medicine. This is so wrong against human beings. It, 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 I mean, are we free or not? Because we're not. And if you think you are, give your head a shake and have a look at what Jerry's going through and then all the rest of us are going through. I had a guy today come and tell me, one of the street workers out there that was doing a project, we caused ourselves a little bit of problems today. Mm, I <laughs> see <your> move. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. But I wouldn't know. Uh, there's street workers out there tearing up the street because uh, my manager complained about the, the drain being plugged all the time. It turns out the hydro guys 20 years ago came through and their lines go underneath the drain lines of the, the street water. Uh, and so they just chopped right through the drain water <laughs> and then put their line in it. It's been like that for 20 years. But so now we got these crews out there and a couple of them are very interested in what we're doing. And one of them was just saying that for his mom, um, she was given three to seven months to live with cancer. And he started researching cannabis, and he started giving her Rick Simpson oil, and he gave her a whole bunch of other things, and CBD, and a whole bunch of other, like dandelion, and, and uh, uh, ginger, and a bunch of other things, in all kinds of concoctions that he came up with. And he prolonged her life and gave her a pretty good quality of life for 28 months. Uh, so he was interested as well. But he said, you know, back in the day, that there was dispensaries that you could walk <laughs> into, and he could get all of these things. 
But then, you know, here comes first the city of Vancouver with their regulating of illegal dispensaries where they said no more edibles and all this other restrictions they put on. And then legalization comes along and same thing. I mean, you may as well say no more edibles because the edibles they're going to sell you are 10 milligrams. Yeah. And that's not going to be nothing for anybody that really needs it in any significant way. So, yeah, it's a, it's a crazy wrong criminal situation here, Jerry, we're talking about. And in your case, you're, you're in the courts where we're going to allow for maybe a wise adjudicator to determine whether or not uh, you had any mens rea, you know, yeah. if, if your intentions were to make money and not caring yeah. that you were hurting other people in the process, yeah. or whether you were uh, actually providing action that hurt people. So yeah. it's, uh, it's hopefully good that we get to go to court, because you never hurt nobody. Yo, he seemed pretty all right, man. Yeah, that guy, uh, the crown there. Yeah, you, yeah you, didn't, uh, you didn't hurt anybody in, yeah. in four years of operating your dispensary. Thousand members? Yeah, well, yeah thousand then, members. Yeah. Um, you would have how many people a day come in and, and get a product from you? Oh, I don't know. 20, Sometimes 50, 100? up two hours long. Right? Yeah. Right? So you dispensed a whole lot of doses yeah. of cannabis. Uh, you never had anybody try to sue you because they were significantly harmed by your cannabis? Um, well, I don't know if they were significantly harmed, but Peace Naturals tried to sue me. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's probably a different thing, though. That wasn't just hurt your mother. Free Charlotte's Web to the kids. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that, who does that hurt, and yeah. how does it hurt them, right, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. What a world we live in here. Yeah. Are the courts seriously going to be using business ethics yeah. instead of human ethics to determine yeah. things? I mean, yeah. really? Is that the kind of world we want, where we've got business ethics involved yeah. there, and it's going to be okay that, uh, you know, in, in your case, the government has just decided to try to protect financial interests, and, uh, you know, that's who you were threatening, yeah. whereas you were causing so much goodwill in the community yeah. with, with what you were doing with the money that you yeah. got, for one thing. But more than that, all of these doses of cannabis, I mean, every one of them is a blessing. Yeah. Every one of them is a blessing. Everybody that comes and gets cannabis from you or us or anybody, every, every dose of that is a blessing. They take that cannabis, they ingest it, and they feel blessed. They're so I'm happy that they have it. It's <laughs> like, I know what that feels like. My whole life it's yeah. been like that. Yeah. You know? The last Either 20 stuff. years I've had enough cannabis, but, yeah. but all before that, almost nobody has enough cannabis. Yeah. I'm really sorry to all you people that are jealous of, of yeah. pot activists because we have access to cannabis all the time and we're never hurting for it. Yes, and, I, and I apologize yeah, for that a little bit, that. but not too much. Uh, <laughs> you too could be a pot activist. <laughs> yeah. But for most people, it's not easy to get, and, and, it, yeah. and when they get it, it's a blessing. They're really yeah. happy to have it, and every time they take it, it's like, thank you, uh, thank you. So, what a mixed up, upside down world, where you put out, I gotta say millions, mm. over four years. We've put out over 20 million milligrams of uh, high dose yeah. edibles, uh, just in the four years that we've been running the kind of a substitution project. Uh, you were four years in an actual dispensary. We were only for most of it just twice a week for an hour and a half at a time. Yeah. So millions, millions of doses that you put into your community, millions of people feeling blessed and thankful and benefiting from that. Nobody being harmed right. in any significant way other than maybe greening out on, on too much good yeah. quality concentrate at some point when they're not used to how much edibles to eat or you know, whatever. Yeah, I don't even be. recall any of that ever happening. Not too much. Yeah. Me too. You know, when, yeah. when we started the project, I'd, I'd given out lots of care packs to people. Yeah. And it's now a couple months into yeah. it. And I'm in front of the, the Van Du board, and I'm just, you know, telling them the update of the project. And I said, thankfully, uh, it doesn't seem we've had more than maybe the, the fingers on one hand of people that have eaten too much. Because yeah. we are giving out... Uh, yeah. Uh, four to six high dose edibles, so between uh, yeah. 50 and 150 milligrams yeah. per edible. Most people are in a cautious. Batch. They'll start small. Well, not at first, yeah. they're not, and yeah. that's what that's what I learned yeah. because this board of about 13 people that yeah. I said that yeah. to, well, 12 hands went up, because uh, yeah. they were all users of the program too, yeah. right? And I went, oh, okay, I think we had a little bigger problem than I thought yeah. we had. And so we started asking over the next couple of weeks yeah. the people in the lineup. Yeah. And sure enough, just about everybody had eaten too much. They'd yeah. had an uncomfortable night. Yeah. They'd say they spent the night hanging onto a pole, yeah. you know, or yeah. something like that. Um, but they self-regulate pretty quick because yeah. the, the follow-up question was, is, well, have you done it again? And would you do it again? And they were like, no, man, no, yeah. not even too much again. Yeah. And, I, and me too. Yeah. You know, it really put me off edibles my whole life because twice I ate too much. And we try to warn people because you need to be careful. When we're helping people get off of opioids, 
that first experience that they have with the edibles that we give them is going to be crucial in whether or not it's going to work for them or not. If they eat too much, it can turn them right off. So it, it's all very dose-specific. Yeah. Uh, I started to mention that earlier on in the show when I was talking about drugs and, and how dose-specific they are. Like love is a drug, for example. Very dose-specific. <laughs> yeah. Not amount. <laughs> well, it depends on, you know, yeah. I can't get enough of some people, and yeah. then other people, you yeah. know, just a tiny little bit is enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> but yeah, it's all very dose specific, yeah. and people self regulate. And regulation uh, is now our big enemy, apparently. This is what the, the government has now decided they can do uh, to uh, prohibit cannabis, is over regulate it. Uh, we, we screamed for. Uh, Legalize and regulate, yeah. you know, and they heard that and, yeah. and they knew that we had such powerful numbers of people supporting us that they decided they could give us legal regulated cannabis. Mm, they did, and, all right. And they did, yeah. And, yeah. and, and we're probably at fault for being naive yeah. about that. We were naive about the, the liberal government with Trudeau being as well. Honest, yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> because uh, legalize meant that... Uh, you could, have, you could have weed. Uh, regulate meant that you could only buy it off of government sources. <laughs> and so, you know, you can't get it off your friends anymore or the good grower that you've been hooked up with yeah. for years. And, yeah. and the problem is, and, and the reason I say you can't do that anymore is that sure you can. It's because you always were. And he's probably going to keep growing because growers aren't going to stop growing just because they can't be part of the government growing thing. They've got a network of people that they're supplying. And, it, and they're helping to pay their mortgage. So growers aren't going to stop growing just because the government legalizes but doesn't let anybody but their growers grow. And, and, and people that are using cannabis, that even if they tried the government store, they're not going back there. They probably don't, don't even try it because they know already because all the, the cannabis people know that this legalization is not something that we want to support. You're not going to get the cannabis that you can trust there. And you're going to pay your fine up front. It's extremely expensive. So... That person is still going to go to their friends. So you, you will still go there. But they increased the penalties. They, they increased the amount of money that they're supplying to the enforcement agencies. Yeah. Um, and, and they've got the squeeze on in lots of different ways for people that are using illegal cannabis or growing or selling illegal cannabis to do with insurance, to do with banking, to do with so many other yeah. different areas where they've really, they really figured out how to clamp down on people. But it's still got to go on because... Their prices are higher than the prohibition prices. Their weed is never going to be as good because, well, maybe they'll stop irradiating it. Maybe they'll stop spraying chemicals to, to kill the microbes. They probably do at some point because that's all a ludicrous waste as well. I hope they stop all of that. I hope they stop the stupid packaging. I hope they stop the five levels of taxation. I hope they stop making sure that, 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 that other people don't get to grow. And if they did all of that, then we could have a peaceful world here in the cannabis community of stores and people consuming and all the rest of it. But right now it's still a war. They're yeah. still attacking people. They're still wasting our tax dollars. And, and it's, a, it's a farce. It's a bloody farce. Not to mention the main issue with our show, with why this segment and everything, is what they've done to the medical users, the people that need to use it daily. Those people, it, this is an absolute nightmare for them. That's what that guy was saying to me when he was helping his mom. There was dispensaries he could get stuff at. Now he can't find those dispensaries, and thankfully we're here to help him. And hopefully there'll be more like us that are, that are going to be able to do this as well. But, uh, yeah. So, anyway, I'm ranting like crazy today. I'm going to keep ranting for a long time. You know? <laughs> That's, I don't want to rant. I don't want to do this. I, I, I don't want to have to be... You know, talking about government corruption and how bad things are and ruined lives and yeah. all the rest of it. I don't want to do this. I want to have a show, a pot show, that talks about how we've got good stores that we can go into. And we really appreciate public servants uh, getting behind what's right and all that kind of stuff. You want to show me? <laughs> <laughs> Not going there on the show anyway. <laughs> You can ask me anything after the show. It's not relevant. But <laughs> live shows are probably okay. coming out soon. <laughs> yeah, hopefully that should be the case. There should be lots of that because the the stifling of commerce from people that have desires to have certain things, and we're talking about these drugs that you know, there's many of them that are not available due to government policy, and there's many people that want those because that because of government policy and because they might use them in some significant way that might help them. And there's a big problem with the supply of those things being criminalized and all of that that goes along with it. So, uh, yeah. 
Uh, hopefully there will be a whole bunch of them. Uh, Nova Scotia, one of them uh, just passed something for mushrooms there they can allow for medical use. So. Nice. Yeah, that's good. I think mushrooms are going to win before yeah. weed does. Oh, yeah. It's looking like it. We help a lot of people with that here as well. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people that use that uh, that, that commodity. Uh, Dana Larson's also doing some really good yeah. work here with that as well, um, and with coca too. Yeah. Uh, and there's and another you know kids. much much maligned yeah. substance yeah. that certainly does cause problems when not used properly. It can happen to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, what's it? Six fifteen East Cordova. Yep, that's the store. Coca. Is it? That's Dana's store. The Coca store is on Hastings. Oh, he's, no, Hastings, sorry, East Hastings, sorry. Yeah. We're on East Canova. <laughs> Stoner woman. My producers are uh, <laughs> sorry. Yes. quite on the ball. Oh, you know, I, I knew what his address was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my fault. <laughs> Stoner woman. It's 651, We're, isn't it? Yes. No, 615 East Hastings. 615? Yeah. No, it isn't. Okay. I'm going to look it no, up it right isn't. now. No, it isn't. Because it's right beside 649 which was yeah, high score, cafe. and it's farther up the numbers on the street, so I think it's 651. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it is. 651 East Hastings, you can go and see, see? Dana Larson's store, and I uh, recommend that you do, because there's all kinds of valuable uses for these things. The, many people around the world have used coca in very productive ways for them. It helps them in their life, and it's been... Um, bastardized, I guess, but even that's not right. Concentrating something and making it more potent makes it more medical and has much more medical value. Uh, cocaine has a great medical value. It's been used in the dentistry profession for a very long time. It has great medical uh, ad advantages to it, but it also can be misused, and there's misuse of all kinds of different substances, and it can cause problems there. But most of the misuse of these substances, if you really look at it, it's probably driven more by government policy than it is by anything else. The driving underground, for example, yeah. of all of these things. To have a store where you can go in and get education yeah. about what these things are about. Get that's your Peruvian flake. Or, you know, or Who knows? It might help you in your life. It helps people in their life. No, it didn't help me in mine. I, I know. <laughs> you know. I didn't help me in mine either. Yeah. And, you know, and I had, I had yeah. a few years of experience with it as well. And in the end, I certainly rejected it yeah. and was happy to be rid of it. Yeah. And understood that it was um, it had potential to lure me back into misuse. Yeah. yeah. But there were also times when I did enjoy it. I'll mm -hmm. tell you. Yeah. You know, I know there's people out here. There's yeah. one young lady that we're trying to help who uh, started using with her mother at 14. Wow. Uh, heroin. Mm. Got clean at 15 for for three years, three and a half years. She's now uh, 20, uh, back using again, but trying hard to quit. But it's a shame, eh? It's such a shame. And but she has a bit of a love affair going on with this drug use that she has going on. And and so do yeah. many of the drug users in the area. When they yeah. get together and they yeah. and they vocalize what they want to say, they we want to use these drugs. We like the effects of these drugs. See the homeless Fuck off, guy leave us I, alone, sorry Andy yeah. Barty. But Yeah, for the homeless guy where I go eat uh, he's got a place now, they give him a place. But he's back on the corner. Yeah. Even though he's got a place, he spends his day out there because he says, I can't stand it in there, man. Yeah. I just can't sit there. At least he's got a place yeah. to sleep at Yeah, night. so yeah, he's That's the only people really need a place to sleep at night, a yeah. safe place to yeah. sleep at night. Yeah. But, uh, but sure, there's, there's lots of people that are using lots of these different drugs, and they don't hate it. Yeah. They love it. Yeah. They, they don't want to stop in yeah. many cases as well. And that's their business. Yeah. That's totally their business. Yeah. Um, some people run their lives. Mm -hmm. Like, they're functioning addicts yeah. of, of, you know, these yeah. harder substances, yeah. and maybe they're not completely happy with the fact that they would have to go through a physical withdrawal to yeah. stop using it. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's times when they wake up, uh, you know, in the morning and they're not feeling well because of how much they used the night before. Maybe yeah. there's times they're going to the bathroom and it's not working right, their stuff's not working. Heart, you know, maybe they're getting shit that's not clean. Maybe, there's, yeah. maybe they're having trouble getting what they want. Yeah. All of these different things are all involved in all of that. But it's a personal human being's journey. And it doesn't help when the government says you just can't have it and puts in some big, huge apparatus of enforcement to make sure you can. That doesn't make it better. That makes it worse. 
that makes more people want to do it and do it in harmful ways and not even able to do it in non-harmful ways. That's what these people here in this neighborhood rally for is a safe supply and an ability to do these things where they're left alone. They just want to be left alone. They're human yeah. beings. They're suffering with things you can't even imagine. Ter seriously. Yeah. I mean, the people we encounter yeah. and over the years in this neighborhood, when they start to give us a glimpse into what happened in their lives and yeah. how they... Holy shit, man. You do whatever drug you want, man. Yeah. You know, I'll help you get yeah. it if I can for you. Because, yeah. you know, they're in, in this personal struggle that is so, so difficult and yeah. individual. Yeah. And nobody gets to know and nobody gets to dictate. That's yeah. my opinion. It's just wrong. It's criminal to dictate to people that you can't fight your battle in whatever way you want if you're not hurting somebody else. You know, Try whatever you want. But let's have public servants and people that care. Obviously, we can't just rely on public servants. We need societies of people that care. Groups of people that, that have a heart, have some compassion, maybe have a personal experience that drives them. But they want to help. We need to have these people helping people, not hurting people. We need to allow people to do what they need to do in the best way that is for them. Yeah. And boy, we sure don't get that with public servants. We sure don't get that with corporations. You know, um, we can solve this situation. We can have a much, much, much better world if the government gets out of drug policy, if the government gets out of criminalizing people for, for behaviors that aren't criminal, and allow and give people support the government that's what i want them for i want societies to do this too because they're better at it but i want governments to educate us i want them to hire scientists and actually tell the truth have a, a ministry of truth that everything from all the other ministries has to filter through the ministry of truth where it's determined is this because some corporation wants you to say this you know and that be the real filter yeah. you know Who's buying our government and, and getting them to say things that satisfy their needs and not right. the, the main populace and individuals? Uh, th this is criminal. It's corrupt. It's such a huge, huge level here. We've got to stop this somehow. Uh, I'm trying to do it in a happy way. You know, there, this situation that we're in right now as a, as a cannabis community would have caused violent revolt if it had been any other community other than cannabis mm -hmm. and it had been any other uh, time in history and still today in most other countries around the world. People wouldn't put up with this that level yeah. of, of ty tyranny and dictatorship, especially when people are dying. And it's not just the overdose crisis that's killing people. It's all kinds of things in our environment. It's cancer, and it's, it's Alzheimer's, and it's Parkinson's disease, and it's, it's uh, um, heart disease, and it's all these other things. And cannabis can help with all of those conditions. So here's this commodity in our environment that can help save your mom, you know, can help stop your child from having epileptic fits, and the government has decided, you can't have that! Who the fuck are these people? Sorry, Annie Barbie, but I'm getting really upset about this. And I mean, week after week, I think I'm going to be getting more and more upset. And I don't mean to be angry, because I know that, that turns people off. But damn it, you know, I'm, I'm just mad as hell, and I can't take too much, you know, for too much longer, I think. Because this is just wrong. I thought before, you know, should I jump up on a building and get naked and have a, a <laughs> hunger strike? Would that do it? I don't think so. Don't Nobody think would so. even pay attention to that. It wouldn't even feed me. <laughs> but what can you do, you know? I don't want to do anything violent. I don't want to do anything that's over the top, uh, you know, yeah. going to inconvenience or harm anybody. I would never do that. But at the same time, they're harming a lot of people in yeah. this, you know, seriously. Sure. And something should be done about it. Some international police force of, of truth and right should be formed to go in. Yeah. I don't know what, you know? I don't want gun to gun. I want a peaceful evolution driven by love and understanding and truth. That's what I want. That's what I'm trying to get. <coughs> this, is my, this is my best, best <laughs> shot at it, is uh, you know, try to get low barrier access to cannabis and have a pot TV show where I can talk yeah. about it every week. And, you know, that's sort of, these have been my plans. I don't know what yours are, and I'm sure lots of you people out there would say, well, you can do better things than that. Right. You know, well, good. Please help us. Please yeah. do this. Uh, you know, for us and for the generations to come, uh, especially with surveillance uh, technology the way it is these days, we need to get government powers back in a box that we can control where they don't have the ability to, to do what they're doing, to make such a mess out of our world. This is crazy that we've allowed this. I, I, I think, I'm not sure, but I think at some point in what we had going on here with our democracy, there was a point where people were being much better represented by government and treated by government, maybe not, certainly not the indigenous people, oh my God, 
oh my God. But, uh, you know, that there was a point where, you know, people had more rights than we'd ever had in millennia, or ever, you know, as, as people. As peoples, I think we've always been under the thumb of some dictator or ruler or somebody that, you know, figured out that, you know, they could, yeah, they could exploit us. And so I think we got to some point that was, you know, the best we had ever had. And since then, we've gone a long ways backwards in allowing the financial elite of this world yeah. to uh, control our lives and our governments and our public servants. And we need to get a handle on that and somehow turn that back the other way. I believe it can happen through education, through enough people understanding, waking up, caring about it, talking about it, and doing whatever it is you can do. There's a whole bunch of things people can do. I'm doing this. Uh, there's letters you can write. And that's the easy thing, right? That if, you, if you can only do the easy thing, and I totally understand. Like a minimum, some people, that's all they got. They got all kinds of shit going on in their life, families yeah. and lots of things. So, but just a minimum, write an email. Take 15, 20 minutes and sit down and construct an email that, that, that shows how you feel and send it to a whole bunch of different people or something like that. That's an easy one. There's lots of things we can do. We can make up signs. We can put phone radio stations or, or, or write letters to editors and so much, you know. But yeah. do stuff. We've got to do stuff because it's serious, man. It's really getting serious. Uh, when, when I look at some of the, you know, my son constantly upgrades me and I don't, I don't trust him for my news. He's not always accurate. He's a little bit... Um, uh, conspiracy fear, mostly right, more right than it's wrong. It's just theory now. There's no more conspiracy. Yeah, it's just, it's just what it is. This is all coming true. Yeah, it just is what it is. <laughs> so yeah, there's now. a lot of things, a lot of, yeah. of rules that are being put into place, and a lot of new powers that are being, yeah. you know, grabbed and things. Yeah. And I think we're in more and more trouble down the road. And, and I'd like to see it get to a point where we're in more and more uh, positivity as we go forward. That there's lots of good movements happening. I think we're going to get out of this. Uh, epidemic and find out, uh, you know, what we got, what we want, uh, you know, yeah. where we're at. Uh, certainly we've all had a lot yeah. of time to think about uh, the, the things in life that, yeah. uh, that we might want. And I think what we need to have first and foremost is a system of governance that allows us to be the people we want to be and to not have this mess of society with drug gangs killing each other and supplying poison drugs all over the place and police out there worried about what powder you might have or what herb you might have. All of that needs to stop, and if we could somehow stop all of that, I know there'd be a huge economic collapse <laughs> because so much of it is, is, is economically driven. But it would it would it would change our society in the yeah. ways that we need to have it change if we're going to have a future on this planet. That's what I believe. Maybe I'm now talking like my son. We're all doomed. <laughs> we're all doomed unless we do it. Well, I don't know if we're all doomed unless we do it, but yeah. already we're experiencing a lot of bad things because we haven't done it to this point. So yeah. you know. We were doing when we were growing up. We were, we were the Russians were going to bomb us, and we didn't build yeah. bomb shelters. We're that clock things. is still there. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know? yeah, yeah I know. Plus a whole bunch of other stuff. But most of it uh, has come along, and you know, to every action there's a reaction. The pendulum swings both there ways. There is always a constant and state of fear. A constant state of fear is what they try to maintain, yeah. and yeah. there's always the next thing to be afraid of. Yeah. And there's always too many people that buy into it. Yeah. So, you know that. Uh, you know, you can see that with this pandemic. We're going to be able to uh, get rid of our masks, apparently, right, first. on uh, July 1st, is the proclamation from our public servants, yeah, we'll and we'll, see so that. we'll see what happens, but I suspect yeah. there will be a lot of people out there that don't get rid of their masks. Right. As long as we have 70% of the per population. Yeah, I know, a lot shot. of people are so used to wearing them. But we're at 74 now, so we're good. Right. I think there must be other reasons for it. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I, I wonder... But frankly, I appreciate them in some places. <laughs> in some places, that was a good in the winter time, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah. Uh, when you're robbing, if you're going to rob a bank, you know, if you've got any nefarious ideas, it's good that now you can walk around with a mask yeah, on. You know? And yeah. some of these people wear really elaborate masks. Yeah. There's, there's just sunglasses, yeah. there's a bandana, yeah. there's a, they don't a even hoodie. Know. Here's they my no idea. idea. They don't even get you to take your mask off and jacket. It's crazy. So, fun, so yeah, yeah. They, but I, I think that I there must be that some that other day. reasons why people are, are continuing to wear masks yeah. and are wearing masks in places where if you didn't want to wear it, yeah. you wouldn't be wearing it. Yeah. Like, wait, if you don't want it, I, I can't stand it. I can't breathe properly. Yeah, me too. It, it yeah. restricts my... It, there's lots of things. And yeah. wah, 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 I know, you know, save other people's lives. I yeah. got it. But, you know, so I don't want to wear it. Mm. So I wear it strategically. When it's necessary, when I'm going to help save somebody's life, you know, yeah. I'll put the thing on. Mostly it's when I have to walk into a store and you have yeah. to have it on. But no, it's more than that too. I don't get too close to people because, uh, yeah, you can catch dangerous things apparently. And, but if I have to, then I'm going to put the mask on during a pandemic because that's the right thing to do. I'm not sick, but who knows. 
right? All of that kind of stuff. But I don't like it. I don't want to wear it. So when I don't no, need I it, it like it. here, and when we're doing this type of thing, mm -hmm. I don't need to wear it, so I'm not going to wear it. And I wonder why it is that there are so many people that are wearing it in situations where a little bit of clear thinking, you'd yeah. know that you don't need that on right now. For some of them. Might be a fashion it thing. It is. It's become a total industry, man. It is an industry, it's a big industry, and there is fashionable masks. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are saying it's because they want to wear yeah, the mask. Really Nobody mask. has cold this year. <laughs> Nobody had a flu this So let's year. just always all wear masks and never hug each other. Yeah, either. but yeah. you know what? That's oh, not man. good because oh, we know man. our immune systems need to be worked. They do need to be worked. Exactly. We need the cold so and the take flu. Your mask and off, the people you that know. die from the cold and the flu, I'm very sorry. But mm. that's just nature doing what it does, mm. man, yeah. I'll tell you. Yeah. And, and the strong survive and, mm. and go on to breed and have more strong people. Mm. You know, and I'm not trying to be insensitive. If anybody knows me, I'm not insensitive. No. But, uh, but yeah, so before this happened, there was a few people that, that mostly from a particular ethnic group, that would be wearing masks uh, out in public. And my son and I were talking about that and wondering about that, and he was con convinced that they were sick and they just didn't want to spread their germs. So, I... Um, like he hated it because he hates me asking people random questions. He's, he's kind of an introvert that way, and I'm kind of the opposite. If I want to know something, I'll go ask you. you know? I'll, I'll be nice about it. I'm not trying to hurt you anyway. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm curious. I want to know. So I started asking people be, long before COVID hit why they were wearing masks. I, I would say, is that for your protection or our protection? Mm -hmm. And she almost always would say, oh, that's for my protection. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm afraid of things. So they were, it was a fear based Pollution. thing. Pollution yeah, in some uh, countries, in countries, countries, like countries, the Philippines, it's really bad pollution. Yeah. That's yeah. true, too. They wear masks there, too, so they think yeah, that that's probably not wearing masks. We, since we have pollution here in Vancouver, not like they do, yeah. but it's it's probably for the same we reason. We should widen our camera. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's probably good. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely true. And that's uh, justified as well. I saw a report on um, the new freeway that they were going to put in on the other side of the Fraser River there. And part of the government's uh, due diligence on figuring out all the, the, the dynamics of it was that uh, there would be X amount of deaths from the added pollution mm. from the trucks mm. on that highway. Wow. And that was in there in black and white. Wow. This was the estimated how many people were going to die over the course of this much time wow. uh, based on the, the added pollution. And that led to some talk on the open line radio shows about it. And that there were other jurisdictions as well where they had absolute documented wow. people die when you put a freeway in them. If you're, if you're living close to the freeway and the oh, levels go up. Yeah, so that's interesting stuff too. Uh, uh, anyway, with your case, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should get back to that. Uh, with Jerry's case, um, he, he's had his uh, one day in court to be able to explain himself and put in an affidavit before that. I, I should, that that's the main way yeah. that you had your say. Yeah. And then we cross examined on that. Yeah. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, final arguments coming uh, September 15th and 16th. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. And then uh, from there, a decision at some point. And we'll see if the courts say that people should have a store to walk into to be able to purchase their cannabis products uh, as opposed to having to do it uh, online and even then not getting the product that they want. So yeah. we'll see. Fingers firmly crossed on that. I don't know, maybe you can write letters to judges. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, yeah, I don't know how sure that works either. I don't know. But uh, write letters to somebody yeah. and say, hey, I support uh, stores to be able to walk into. don't want to have to get my, my products for cannabis online, or I can't get my products online, uh, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, the key is actually low barrier. Uh, we've been fighting for legalization for a long time here. For me, it's about 20-some years, uh, but it goes back way beyond that, uh, into the 70s and, and all the rest of it. And so... Uh, what we've been fighting for all this time, we didn't know it, but what we've been fighting for is low barrier access. It wasn't just legalization. Uh, it wasn't legalization with regulation. Some regulations are fine for things if regulations are required. Maybe some concentrates and edibles for sure. There should be some regulation in as, mu in as mild a form as possible, as always. Least intrusive on our rights as possible. And warnings is all we need. So, you know, a little warning on the label. Hey, you can eat too much edibles. You won't like it very much. Try not to do that. And then people will eat too much anyway, and then they'll learn for themselves, and then they won't eat too much the next time. That's how that works. But we, uh, you know, we don't need to have all of these uh, regulations on things. We need low barrier access. And that means that poor people can get cannabis too. It doesn't need to be super highly priced. I get it. People want to spend a bunch of money on, on good weed, and there's really good weed out there that people produce with a lot of money put yeah. into it and a lot of expertise. That's great. We should have connoisseur weed stores. I'm sure we always will. 
but we need low barrier stores too. And, and low barrier is kind of dumb. It should just be regular stores, mm -hmm. you know, that, that regular people can walk into and, and pay a price that is reflective of what it takes to bring it to market. And we would have people producing cannabis, bringing it to market, that wouldn't buy all the expensive equipment, would do it in a way that they can get it there cheaply, like any other fruit and vegetable that we have. And so we need these stores, and that's what we're fighting for. So the new, the new uh, legalization is low barrier access. Uh, that's, that's the new cause. It's no different than the old cause. Nothing really has changed, except uh, one of the new drug dealers in town is your very own government, and uh, they're the real cartel. Uh, but we avoid them, of course, because we understand who they are. And uh, yeah, that's what's going on. So thanks, Jerry. I appreciate that. Yeah. You, um, just quickly, as always, you do have your pursuit of uh, freedom of thought, yeah. through, uh, the, the, yeah. the legalization of that. Yeah. And the way people can find out about that is? Uh, mindtech.ca. Um, we'll have some uh, info on there soon, uh, but the freedom okay. of thought, Paul's just uh, writing it up a little earlier there. Nice. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what a hero in the future when we look back, uh, you know, years and years from now, and we realize that uh, for many decades the government was in a war against our minds and our thoughts. And uh, we had to get out of that somehow. And it's guys like Jerry, he's not alone. Uh, there's a number of people around the world that are fighting for this. And, and uh, psychedelic uh, legalization is kind of at the forefront of that because that's, that's where you're talking about that. That's where people get to think what they want to think. And it's nobody's business but yours what you're thinking about, what's going on in your head. If you want something going on in your head, that's nobody's business but yours. Certainly not your government. Certainly not a corporation's. And, uh, you know, maybe your parents, but that's a different story. Anyway... Uh, thank you for all of that. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, hanging in there and fighting the good fight and coming and telling us about it every week or most weeks. And we'll see you around next week. Well, it's good to have you. I don't know what you're pointing at, Glenn. You can tell me, I guess. Nobody put a drink there. I don't know. Oh, I see there's a random joint there. <laughs> a random joint there. These yeah. are important things that our audience really needs to know about. We found a random joint, uh, folks. So. I already told you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> oh, life is good, and I hope life is good for you, because, uh, you know, you only get one shot at it, and you only get this moment, as a matter of fact. There's no guarantee of any future moments, and I hope you're having as much fun in this moment as you can. Uh, as always, as we pursue all of these things, uh, do it in a spirit of uh, loving life and uh, loving the pursuit of your life and your freedom and all of that. Uh, uh, do it with uh, as much positivity as you can, and I think you'll have better results than, uh, than being all down and depressed and angry about things. Although a little bit of anger at the core of things, like I certainly have going on, uh, is a driver of uh, getting things done. And uh, I think that I can't deny that. I wouldn't deny that. I wouldn't deny anybody their right to be angry about all of these things. But I do think the way to pursue things, uh, for the most part, is to have a pretty good balance. And uh, the balance should be more in favor of uh, having positive experiences than negative. And uh, we can do that by uh, feeling good about educating ourselves and, uh, and furthering uh, these causes. There's many of them uh, where humans are endeavoring to have more freedom and, and more abilities and uh, all of that stuff that humans do. Uh, there's many of those different causes going on. And as you're pursuing those causes... Uh, uh, be positive about it. Be happy that you're able to do that, that you're able to contribute in some way and that there is something we can do about it. And even just educating yourself is a big part of being able to give back because you really can't give back and help other people unless you really know what's going on. So the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of uh, all of the different ins and outs of these things is important. And uh, I hope you can uh, do that with a sense of positivity uh, and not just uh, anger at the drug war and the situation we're in. Uh, this situation has been developing for about uh, 4 billion years on this planet since we were microbes and uh, since uh, all kinds of other things have happened along the way. And it all makes sense if you look at the history of it. But where we go from here is what we want to think about and uh, what we can do something about. We can't really change things in the past. We can change uh, what we do now and how we feel about things and what we can accomplish in the future. And so that, uh, for me, is a much more uh, focused uh, than, uh, than the past. So... The other focus of this show for the last year now, it's, it'll be uh, a year in two days since we uh, opened our low barrier access uh, community cannabis shop in good faith based on a, a city of Vancouver motion to support low barrier access for cannabis. Uh, in that year, uh, we've been broadcasting uh, rather from the Plot TV studios, we've been doing it uh, from the store here. Uh, was a store for four and a half months. Uh, since then, it's become... Uh, you know, just where we keep uh, some of our stock and where we organize stuff. And, uh, you know, we're, 
we're just really what we're doing is we're paying rent here so we can keep the space because we we do firmly believe I do have serious hope that uh, we are going to get approval by our public servants to do what we're doing here because it just makes no sense that we wouldn't get that uh, it does make some sense I guess that it's uh, taken some time although I think it's an unreasonable amount of time now uh, we opened our store a year ago uh, the City of Vancouver would not support us, as their motion said that they would, at least not in the sense of giving us a license that would allow for our landlord to uh, not have to fear some sort of uh, prosecution or fines from uh, renting to a cannabis store. Um, they have uh, the councillor, certainly Rebecca Bly and Jean Swanson, and the whole council, including the mayor, voted unanimously to support uh, you know, what we're doing here. And we're trying to do it as best we can to be in line with what the city would want and what this neighborhood needs. And that's by supplying cannabis to people. So for four years and over four months, uh, we've been uh, providing cannabis as uh, easy as possible, as low barrier as possible, to help offset the opioid crisis that's been gripping uh, the downtown east side of this city, but uh, the entire city and the entire province and the entire country and the entire continent for about five years now. And our response to that overdose uh, crisis, a crisis of a poisoned drug supply with uh, fentanyl being introduced into the opioids and into some of the other substances like cocaine and meth, that uh, that was killing people at an alarming rate. Uh, it was causing great destruction within our society and our communities, within our families. Uh, it was putting a huge toll and taxing our uh, first responders and our hospital facilities. And our response to that was, uh, an understanding that cannabis has a role to play in helping people get off of opioids and to avoid the street drugs that are uh, tainted, uh, especially in the form of edibles. In fact, I would say only in the form of edibles. Cannabis is very effective for most people, if used properly and done properly, to get through the withdrawal uh, period of, of getting off of drugs uh, that is the, the barrier to to stopping the addiction. The real reason people are addicted, the word is addicted, is because they can't stop. And the reason they can't stop is because they get sick. It's not just that you have a craving so bad that you're going to you know, run to your dealer. It's not the craving so much as the craving to not be sick. And so that's the real thing, the impetus or the, the impediment, rather, sorry, to, uh, to people getting off of these drugs. And cannabis in the form of edibles can do that and has done that very effectively for hundreds of people that we've been helping over the last four years and four months and continues to do so and many other people that have found that same success. Uh, even prior to our program uh, starting, uh, I had experience with many, many dozens of people because of the dispensary that we opened uh, 17 years ago right here by Maine and Hastings that that's where I learned that high dose edibles, that's where we found out was people would come and tell us that our brownies and our, our cake, our infused edibles could get them through withdrawal and get them off those drugs. And in that course of time, uh, dozens and dozens of people that I know that'll tell me that cannabis saved their life and got them off of the hard drugs. And so this is obviously something that works. And in fact, Dr. MJ Malloy has uh, done well over 50 studies that have been released uh, since he started doing this. Uh, looking into the effectiveness of cannabis uh, as a substitute uh, for opioids and other street drugs, but also for a way to address the drivers of addiction. All of those things like depression and pain and, and things that cause people to require drugs in the first place. Uh, the vast majority of people who end up in a, in a relationship with opioids and street drugs that they can't get off of are people that are also struggling with trauma and pain. And that's the reason that they need to use something to deal with that, to, those issues that they have. And they found that those can help them get through another night, and that's why they're on them. But they become, become very difficult to get off of. It becomes very expensive, and it costs them their life and their livelihood in many cases. So we've been providing cannabis to people as, as easy as possible for over four years. Uh, and that was by giving out care packs of four to six high-dose edibles, a couple of joints, for free twice a week to about 250 to 300 people that would line up to get them. And then in good faith, because of the city's motion, we opened the store and we started supplying low cost cannabis as well as no cost cannabis in a way that uh, re removed as many of the barriers as we could for people and had great success doing that. But without the city's support and with the landlord feeling threatened and we got evicted, but unable to stop our program, of course. And by that time, we had been for four and a half months no longer 
uh, on the sidewalk twice a week with a lineup of people, but operating in a, in a eight hour a day, six day a week uh, fashion, having turned our project into a program, having uh, made members out of the people that were accessing the program, uh, providing them with 420 milligrams of high dose edibles every four days of their choosing from all the, the stuff we have donated and the Cannabis Substitution Program runs completely on donations and always have. It's a, an incredible uh, group and, and uh, dozens and dozens of people that have helped us over the years and continue to help us that allows us to do this. And so uh, we offered it at low cost uh, and, and the whole variety of things, all of the different concentrates. And when you're providing cannabis to people to get off opioids and for medical purposes, and like I say, many of the medical reasons that people are using cannabis are also the drivers of that other addiction to these other drugs, you have to have high quality cannabis. You can't have uh, swag. You can't have low quality. You can't have things that would be uh, you know, unable for people with compromised immune systems to be involved with. So we had to have very good quality cannabis, and we had to have it at prices that were affordable, and then we had to have the whole range of what people needed, and that's what we did. But getting evicted, uh, mostly because we had all these people that were all now on the program, where every four days they're getting their 420, we couldn't stop doing what we were doing. We had to continue, and, and we couldn't really move our location much either because many of the people that we're helping don't have addresses, they don't have contact info, there's no way that they can get a hold of us or vice versa. They just know where we are and they come to us and they get the help that they, they rely on. So we bought an RV and uh, we've been out in this really cool 1981 uh, Scooby Dooby van, this RV, uh, now for over seven months. Uh, I'll mention that when we, and I was getting there, that when we put in, when we got to the notice of eviction, we also, uh, thanks to the great efforts of John Conroy uh, and, and also uh, others, put together an amazing application to Health Canada, one that could not be denied, uh, that uh, laid out clearly the benefits of cannabis for addressing the opioid epidemic that we have going on here. And that uh, low barrier access was crucial to save these people because of the barriers that they face to accessing cannabis in any other way that are legal. And so we put that application, and that's been over eight and a half months now since we put that application in. Uh, we also put it in, that, in with that application an emergency application for a temporary exemption from the Cannabis Act to allow us to continue to operate in the store. If, we, if, if the federal government had done that, if Health Canada had done that, then the city would have allowed us to come back into the store. They would have provided us with a license to do that, but they didn't. Uh, they said when they got the application, the very next day we got communication from the federal health minister, Judy Tayeb, you are not Judy Tayeb, <laughs> Patty Haydu, totally different person, that uh, they had received our application and that they would try to process it in a timely manner, understanding the emergency nature of us facing eviction at that time. But we didn't hear from them again for almost three months. And then that was just before Christmas time. And they apologized and they said, it's sorry we're taking so long on this. It's complicated because if we give it to you, there's going to be other people that are going to want it as well. Well, that's a good thing. That's what I told them. That's a good thing. This is what's needed in lots of communities across Canada. There's people suffering from this epidemic in, in areas like the downtown east side that need low barrier access to cannabis all across Canada. They'll be heroes if they were to do that. There's a lot of political currency at play here and they could gain a lot of points by getting behind what we're doing. There's a lot of Canadians that would support that. And there's going to be a lot of Canadians that are going to really wonder why a government of public servants wouldn't allow for the, the distribution of a natural plant product that helps people get off of opioids to save their lives. Like, why, why wouldn't the government allow that? It seems rather weird, you know, it has to be something going on. In fact, it's major corruption that's going on, and that's what we're able to expose through this as well. But we've been doing our thing out of the RV. We've been helping all these people. Uh, we did get raided uh, by the police uh, two weeks after moving out of the store, but apparently it was a mistake. They didn't understand who we were and how much support we had and what we were actually doing here and that we had an application into the federal government. Uh, it was just the anti-vending unit because we had signs up for the cannabis substitution program that, uh, you know, were showing and talking about what we were doing and stuff like that, that uh, they noticed us and we had uh, jars of cannabis flour in the window of the RV, so not allowed to have cannabis on display. So they swooped in on us, wouldn't listen to me, try to explain ourselves, try, wouldn't look at the letters that we have from doctors and professors and other people within the harm reduction industry, uh, took away the products that we had in the RV, which was everything that we had at the time, and um, made us move the RV, but I just moved it to the police station where I complained and uh, asked to speak to a senior officer, which they didn't allow me to do because of COVID, and said somebody would call me. 
And then I wrote an email to my deputy chief friend that I uh, met when I presented this project to them and the VPD board. And I said, what are you guys doing? Why would you raid us and try to interfere with us when we're doing all of this good work here and all, all the support? And he said it wasn't in his command area. He wasn't aware of it. He would have somebody call me. And the person that called me, what, eight days later, it was uh, Candace Murphy, the head of the downtown east side, uh, beat cops, she said. Uh, she was, seemed very nice. She said, uh, I just got your file, Neil. Uh, what's it all about? So I told her all about it, the whole journey that I just told you about. I told her the same way, except that I really emphasized how much the doctors, the, the Professor Zachary Walsh, Dr. MJ Malloy, the local psychiat psychiatric nurse, uh, the harm reduction groups that had written us letters, putting in writing that our program was saving lives, rescuing people from addiction, and that if we stopped doing what we're doing, people would be put at risk of death. And we have hundreds of people that we're helping. And so she, I made, made that very, very clear. And yet at the end, she said to me, oh, gee, we're really sorry that that's going on for you, and you've had all these troubles, and you can't get your license, and we hope you get your license, but... Uh, until you get your license, you're going to have to stop doing what you're doing. I said, did you not hear what I said to you? Have you really just said that to me? Uh, I can't stop. I wouldn't stop. Not a chance. I'm going to stop. And she said, well, we're going to come and arrest you then. And we had a very nasty conversation for the next five minutes. And I said, well, go ahead and arrest me if you have to. But I can't stop doing what I'm doing, and I won't. And if you arrest me, there's 10 other people who are going to take my place and, you know, keep doing it. And if you take our vehicle, we'll have another vehicle back there within an hour. And we have lots of support. And we're going to keep doing this because maybe you don't care about these people that we're rescuing and helping. But we care about them. And we've come to know them over the years. And we're not going to turn our backs on them. So that was uh, oh, seven months ago now that that conversation happened. A little more than that. And uh, we have not had any more interference from the VPD. We are one block away from them. Uh, we came back and parked um, almost in, no, exactly in the same spot as we were uh, uh, less than an hour before they ordered us to leave and stole all of our stuff. Uh, they sent the parking people after us. The parking manager came and threatened me, and uh, I did move it. Um, he said I couldn't park anywhere on the block ever again. I told him that our program was much too important for that, and uh, it was uh, against uh, my will, but I would move it at that point. So I did drive it around the block. He went away, and I just parked it like, 20 feet or 60 feet back from where we had it originally and we've been there ever since and uh, we did have the parking manager guy come back one time and threaten me again and tell me he was going to give us a ticket every day and I said well we'll figure out how to pay that then but we have to keep doing what we're doing and he has never been back and we have never had another ticket on the RV and we've been there for uh, over seven months so we're going to go visit the RV and see what's going on out there but there's an update of where we're at we still haven't had uh, any further uh, communication. Uh, I will say that meeting before Christmas uh, with uh, Health Canada uh, where they apologized for taking so long. They said that they would maybe have it done for us in early January and uh, here we are in uh, early June. Uh, they did contact us uh, I think it was end of March and said they were still working diligently on it and that we should just be patient. Yeah well what other choice do we have? We're not we're not waiting for them in any sense, other than we'd like to be back in the store, and we're not going to do that, I guess, until they give us permission. But we certainly wouldn't stop what we're doing with providing uh, cannabis to people here on the downtown east side. And so uh, we're being patient, but we're getting more and more frustrated all the time, and we're certainly aware that they're costing uh, people's lives by doing what they're doing. They're diminishing our capacity to help people. We have many great plans that we will start putting into effect once we get our license to in increase the ability to help people. Uh, we think we're going to get some government funding uh, as the city motion included support for, for our efforts at the uh, you know, at, at time when we get a license from Health Canada, they will support us. And if we have support from any level of government, we'll be able to greatly increase what it is that we're able to do here and in other communities across Canada. So the, the delays that we're facing every day are taking a toll in human lives and the ability of us as a society and as a community to properly help people with what is just a natural herb that harms no one and helps many, but is too financially valuable for the corporate greedy bastards that have their hooks into it to let it be uh, distributed in any reasonable manner. So let's go see what's going on at the RV. <laughs> I want my hoodie. I think I do, because we have these hoodies. <laughs> Thank you.
Beautiful hoodie. You could be the proud owner of a cannabis substitution program hoodie. <laughs> so, this is uh, the downtown east side of Vancouver. We have a little construction going on, and our RV used to be uh, right over there where that pile of gravel is. And uh, now we're back to where we started this journey in the RV. And that's back up on the corner. This is Main Street in Vancouver right here, and that's the police station right there, and that's the courthouse right there to the left. That's the old police station right there on the right. And this is where we're, uh, we're parking our RV right now to do our thing. Um, there's, there's Jen in the window. Say hi. I'll come in and talk to you guys in a minute. I want to make sure that I, I, I give a big shout out to Chris Backer and Mary McCarty. Uh, two people that are running the cannabis substitution program in other parts of Canada. Chris is in Halifax and he's been doing it for over a year and a half. Great support from his community and doing a wonderful job there, uh, keeping the place clean, helping people get access to what they need, saving people's lives. And Mary McCarty in London, Ontario. Um, boy, you know, I, there was a tragedy last night in London, Ontario. Another one, and, and uh, I'm so sorry to the families and my condolences to everyone. Uh, in the community uh, for what happened there. But Mary's there as well. Thank goodness Mary's there. At least there's some positivity going on. Uh, and they need as many Marys as they can. Uh, Mary was our head baker here at the Cannabis Substitution Program in Vancouver for years. And uh, she's gone back to London, Ontario, and she started the program there. Just did her eighth week since arriving there. Uh, great support from her community. The police came by again today. Uh, she thinks maybe they were looking for somebody, but they were nice. They just said hi. Uh, and she's got a, a shop there, 420 Elizabeth Street, that someone is allowing her to use on Tuesdays to do her once a week giveaway. I think she said 176 people today. So uh, kudos to, to Chris and to Mary and all the volunteers and all the donators that help those people. It's all done through volunteers and donators. If you're in either of those two areas or you want to help out in, in either of those two areas of Nova Scotia or Ontario, then uh, that's a great place to put some effort. Uh, those people could use some donations in any form. And, uh, and thank you so much to everybody that's helping out and everybody that wants to help out. Uh, this is a situation that is of dire need and uh, all the people that are helping out are just saints and I love you all. And uh, this is our effort here in Vancouver. Uh, needs a wash, but this is our uh, Scooby Dooby van. You want to say hi at the window again? Hi. So we peek in through here. Where are you? There we are. Well, it's smoky in there. Oh no, there's a fire. Oh, there's a good fire. There's always a fire. Always in the... a good fire. Oh, there's the source right there. Is that an Andrew joint? No, it's a George uh, joint. That's a George joint, yeah, eh? It's long and skinny. Long and skinny. Yeah. Unlike George, yeah. who may well be long. <laughs> Let's go meet the crew. Oh, are you are you looking better these days? Are you losing weight at all, or is it still status quo? What's going on? I'm losing everything. You're losing it all. Your <laughs> teeth, your hair, too, man. your He's hair, your mind. Just like I am. Oh, I'm so proud of you, George. I'm yeah. so proud of you, Jen. Yeah. Um, I'm sitting over here. Steel Andrew's lighter. So th this is uh, this is the Healing Wave uh, CSP uh, Scooby Dooby van that it's we've been so in. So we've been in for uh, since the 20s now. I think is that it feels like it. Yeah. 20s. No. Okay. So it's only seven months. My goodness. <laughs> I think NASA should be studying what's going on here with people that are cooped up in small, you know, areas for long periods of time here. This is definitely a study, and it's a testament to the characters of the people involved that were not at each other's throats. I think. Ah. Oh, we get lost. We get lost. We got a little spat. Except, except for Jen, I'm in trouble all the time. I have a manager ah. that's demanding on me, and I'm not capable anymore. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> She smiles while she's beating them. It's always, so, um, always well-deserved. So another week. It seems like a week is a day. It, uh, yeah. you know, it comes so quickly. 
And, it's, and another week is outrageous and ridiculous, isn't it? Like, yeah. yeah, but not like we don't Especially enjoy it. Especially I keep seeing all these on. other stupid fucking little cannabis stores popping up. My Auntie Barbie is watching the show. You're careful with your language Sorry. there. Sorry. And children, perhaps. Sorry, Barbie. I do it too. <laughs> but I apologize to you. But it does make me upset. Yeah. If all these other stupid stores can open that are selling crappy weed for outrageous prices. No, but and, they're, and we're being left alone as the... The van, I don't understand why we can't just have a shop. <laughs> Nobody understands except, the, well, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but it makes money, and that's where I do kind of understand it. I mean, I knew that we were up against really powerful forces uh, from, the, from the onset, you know, for me, 20 years ago. Uh, we've come a long, like, long way. Even if they managed to shut us down, our clientele wouldn't shop at those expensive places because they can't afford it. Well, of course. It. Couldn't afford it. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the underground market would continue to, to thrive and have to. You know, yeah. They have to. Because the underground market will look after the low barrier people to some degree, where the government stores don't care at like, all. Like uh, a majority, a lot of people come just for like one dollar gram or one dollar joint. Yeah. All they have is a buck. Yeah. So yeah, they're not gonna get anything with a dollar anywhere else. No, <laughs> not at all. And that joint is such a blessing to them. And then a you free know, edible on top of it, you know, makes the. Who's gonna give them a three hundred milligram edible? Yeah, and of course, anybody that comes here and they can just afford one gram or one joint, they get another joint and they get an edible of, you know, usually 100 milligrams. Um, yeah, we don't turn anybody away here. Uh, lack of money won't prevent you from getting cannabinoids. You can come here every day if you're broke like that. And we have dozens of people that come here every day and they get a joint. Jen insists that they're nice about it. We've, <laughs> we've uh, definitely instituted a, a bit of a new polite at attitude down here on the downtown east side. They yeah, all, at least say please. At least say please, you, you know. know. that a hundred milligram Because they do make... cost a dollar. Yeah, there was, there, there free, was some people that, that, you know, were somewhat <laughs> demanding of, of what we were doing here and they, they wouldn't quite have the right attitude coming to the window. So we we always thought cannabis was a way to adjust people's attitude. Guppy always said it was an attitude adjuster. Yeah. And in a very nice way, Jen kind of encourages them to at least be a little bit thankful that, you know, they're, they're getting something for free and recognize that this is people donating, this is stuff that costs money, this is stuff that, uh, you know, isn't really free, uh, but we want to make sure that everybody gets what they need here. Yeah. And those people that come and purchase off of us uh, allow us to have what we need to give people as well. Uh, yesterday, so, do you know how many people that say they loved, uh, make sure a day they loved that 100 milligram oh. cookie we're giving out today, or the muffin? Yeah, they love it. It makes their day. They yeah. say 100 milligrams. Really? Yeah. yeah. I've got 15. It's so great. And and we have lots of people telling us how strong it is. Yeah, it's very strong. So we let them know before. We they let them know ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. And then we try to make sure they've had experience before. They know what they're doing. Oh, you're gonna make them work? I am. Yeah, I'm gonna oh, work too. Man. Oh yeah. So George. <laughs> Just because you guys right, showed it, doesn't. See if we can bring up that tray of stuff for the CSP. So George is at the back door. For those who don't know. And the back door is where we run our CSP program. People come to the back door, and then they have a number because they're all part of the program, and they get to choose from this amazing variety of things that we have here. Um, got brownies from Roberta, and also we get them from Joe Pepper. Uh, we've got cookies from Robert and from Damon. Uh, we've got uh, Gorilla Ganja. Uh, so thankful to Gorilla Ganja. Colleen helps us out with these ones. Uh, Lucky is where we got these ones from. What else? We got caramels from Robert. Uh, everybody gets a joint. There's other gummies. We just had a company that uh, helped us out with things. Uh, shout out to Jeff Harris for uh, uh, his uh, his donation. And uh, yeah, so that's how that all works. So uh, what can I tell you? Uh, have I not really properly told you about moving the RV? Uh, turns out, uh, because uh, we are very diligent, community-minded people, uh, care about our community, we decided that because the drain wasn't draining properly. Uh, Jen decided she would do something about that. I'm putting it on her. So she uh, called the city and had them come out on three different occasions to try to fix it. Uh, turns out they couldn't fix it. So uh, they brought in the heavy equipment. They made us move the RV. At first they said we had to like not be anywhere on the block. They had the whole thing, no parking. But uh, the street city, city, the city street people like us, and uh, you know they've been here like say three times before dealing with uh, trying to fix it, and so they allowed us to park our RV in the no parking area at the top of the street here, and they've actually allowed uh, other vehicles in behind now as well. They've been really super good about it. Yes. But they uh, they have had to break up the street, and go way down inside the the ground to find that. Uh, 
probably around 20 years ago, the hydro people came through and their lines run about a foot underneath the drain lines and they just plowed right through the drain lines to put their lines in and they never bothered to fix it or tell the city, they just filled it all in with dirt and that's why the drain wouldn't drain and so now they're fixing all of that and it's costing us a huge amount of money. They had one truck here holding up the telephone pole for seven hours at $500 an hour. Uh, they had about uh, eight people on site, but they worked hard, I'll tell you. These people, they were not all standing around being a supervisor. In fact, the main supervisor probably worked as hard as anybody else. They weren't leaning on shovels. They got a hell of a lot done. They tried to get it all done in one day, but they found they're going to have to go down a couple more sections and, and replace more pipe down there as well. So there's going to be lots of major noise uh, from 7 o'clock in the morning and uh, a lot of inconvenience, but uh, that's what's going on. That's why we had to move the RV again. So now we're right back on the corner where we started when we first got the RV. We're right there where the police station is and, uh, you know, uh, we hope that uh, after all this time of being here that they look upon us a little more positively than they did when we first pulled the RV up and that they'll let us stay here. We're not sure if we'll stay here or go back to where we were. I'll give it a couple of days and think about it. But that's what's going on with that. Uh, what do you got to say, buddy? I don't, I don't want to cut you off short or nothing. You got any, you got, you got any plans to make a speech? I don't know. We've had about 25 people or 30 people today. Today, yeah. Right on. And, uh, Everything's going good on CSV, everybody good. likes it, everybody's working at it. We got a bunch more products. <laughs> yeah, we got a bunch more products. Bunch more products over the last couple of days. A whole bunch of our people have brought so stuff in. So the people in. that uh, stepped up and did donations for the CSV are pretty right? good. I like the people that stepped up for the CSV. When we, when Mary left, everybody stepped up and now we're uh, flowing again at CSV. Yep, and yeah. most of them came in the last two days. Sure they did, <laughs> yeah. And what were you going to say? That we went through, like Roberta brought, brought brownies just like a few days ago. Because right. people like them, and they're choosing them, right? These are uh, yeah, yeah they like the brownies. They, they, love, the brownies. Brownies. they love the brownies. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's but the other? Just go so fast. It's like crazy. The, the gorilla ganja that goes really fast as well. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have any the other day, and everybody was. Yeah, taking. we just got another shipment. So uh, everybody this was taking uh, Robert's 150 milligram caramels, right? Two at a time, right? Yeah, they like it. So those are very good. Like too. Those. Yeah, they're very good. He says he delivers real well. Yes, so. Yeah, thanks to all thanks the people to everybody. Carly and brought some more stuff today so as well. Thanks, Carly. Yeah. Uh, I'm forgetting people. That's my big problem is I don't like forgetting people. There's, so there's, everybody. So many of them. there's a lot. And, that, and all, thank of, everybody all of your great. angels. All yeah. of, we couldn't do it without it, all of you everybody too. Everybody like, that donated was you know, great. It's, it's, uh, every donation helps so much. We do get down to it you know, regularly. Uh, today we've had a number of people come with stuff, so we're good for the next few days. Yeah. But it doesn't take long. It goes fast. <coughs> <laughs> about John's muffins as well. Mm. So you, how many are we giving out of those every day? Oh goodness, those are popular now. And these are not part of the CSP program. These are for people that aren't part of the program because we have only a limited amount to be able to give out to people that are in that program. Everybody else, until we can add them, and we are adding more people regularly, but they come to the window and they get one of John's muffins or one of Michael the Cookie Monster's cookies. I can or mention Joe Michael. Joe Pepper's brownies. Joe Pepper's brownies. And uh, that's cool too. Yeah, a lot of people got one of John Muff John's muffins for free and loved them so much they wanted to buy some. Yeah, so we, and that money so all to goes to the CSP. Any money from food. anything that comes in from stuff that's donated goes to the CSP. But they became so popular, we had to put a limit on how many yeah, people we have to buy. Yeah, we do have to put a limit on lots of things. We've had to yeah. put a limit on the one dollar weed on the. So we had some people buying like twenty, twenty-five at a time. Yeah, we've had yeah, that. that's what happens when you have better prices than anybody else. People <laughs> want to come and buy a whole bunch. And good, sure, good, you know, we want to help people. Quality. We want to help as many people as we can. So we've had to limit, uh, you know, for everybody else, we've had to limit. We make sure that everybody gets more than enough for themselves for the days that they may need it. If they're, you know, if they, they, they can only come once a week. We try to make sure they can get what they want. Some people are coming from out of town. And uh, so we try to make, and every we make day, exceptions. Every day we have so many good things said about people that hear about the band. And, you know, it's really good it's that so way. It's so good. We, so many people have heard about it. Yeah. And excellent things to say. And you, government, could have those things said about you if you would just give us a license to go back into the store. People would be saying nice things about government. Instead, they say it about us. Oh, well. We'll take it. But we'd rather have... We'd rather share some good times with the government. We'd rather be in a nice, cuddly relationship with the government. 
That's what I'd like, you know. Mm, yeah, I know. That sounds creepy. <laughs> Being in bed with the government? Or well, I want them to, uh, you know, sure, if I can be the dominant uh, partner. <laughs> <laughs> well, and shouldn't it be that way? I don't think they'll ever let you blindfold them and tie them to a bed. But they're my ser but they're my servant. <laughs> they're my servant. It's supposed to be, but it's not how it is. So I mean, if servant, you know, I mean, if really, if it's a servant, you get more than just your tea and coffee made for you, don't you? <laughs> Probably they're crawling into bed with you. Again, just so I don't mind. Sounds. I don't mind if my servant nicely crawls into bed with me and does what I want. Yeah, but that's not how it works with them. I know, but that's right? how it should work. Wouldn't that be nice, eh? If you could have a nice, cuddly relationship with your public servant? I'd love that. I'd love to look at that police officer on the corner and feel like, oh man, I'm just surrounded by all these cuddly animals and I'm warm and fuzzy inside. He makes me feel so good. I love him. And you may have been doing shrooms a little too often, you? Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> Or maybe this is just an exercise in freedom of thought. And they're going to lock me up like so many other people throughout history that have ex explained things that nobody quite understood. We should love the police. Well, if you're talking about seeing invisible fuzzy animals, then yeah, they might Well, I'm just them. talking about that feeling of love that, you know, we should have for our public servants. I'd like to say to my son, hey, Johnny, I don't have a son named Johnny anyway, but if I did, you know, I'd like to say, hey, Johnny, look at that J Mr. Jones walking down the street there. He's a public servant. He's sacrificing his otherwise better future to help people and to make this world a better place for you and me. That's what I want to say. I want to love my public servant. I want to love that police officer. I want to feel so safe when he's around that, you know, I'm good to be and do and think anything that I want. As long as I'm not hurting anybody else, but I would never do nothing like that. So I should never have to fear a police officer. But you do, you know. When you travel across the country, as I did roller skating from town to town, and then I'd spend a day or so in each town along the way on my way to Ottawa for Remembrance Day, over five and a half months. I did that on the Freedom Tour, uh, three and a half or three years. I did that uh, 2006, 2007, 2008. I did it again in 2012. And when you're doing that, you realize as you come in, like I would go visit the city halls, and you get a sense in talking to the different people there about what their issues are, and you find out that. Uh, there's different bylaws and different rules and laws in all these little towns across Canada. Each one has their own little set of what they do and do not tolerate. And you don't know when you're just arriving in their town. You don't know. You don't know in Nelson, B.C. that when you arrive in town, you can't let your dog out of your car. You can't skateboard down the street once you get out of your car. And you better not be singing or playing a guitar because there's no no music or anything like that allowed. This is all in one little town in, in British Columbia called so Nelson. So you're expected to skateboard in your car? You're not allowed to skateboard on, on any of the main... It only has you two main you streets. Get out of your car, you're not there's allowed to two main streets and you're not allowed to skateboard or inline skate. I was inline skating. Huh. And uh, yeah, they chased us. The cops chased us. <laughs> they actually took uh, Jack's well, skateboard. Well, That's a whole other story. Freedom Tour. One day we'll do a whole bunch yes, on the Freedom Tour. Bad. But for now, this is where we're at. This is our uh, our latest attempt uh, in the cannabis legalization movement to get what we really want in the way of legalization, which apparently is low barrier access, and that's the new the new buzzword for what we want. We don't want legalize and regulate because that wasn't quite right. They figured out how to take advantage of us and still continue to exploit, monopolize, cr criminalize us. And uh, so what we need is low barrier access and no penalties for pot. That's the two bottom lines that we've been fighting for forever, that we're still fighting for, and this is how we're doing it here. Um, thanks to everybody that's helped us get this far in all the different ways that the movement has moved forward. There's uh, so many people that have done so much, and thanks to everybody. Thanks to everybody that's supporting our project. I want to say we have a fair number of these hoodies still. And uh, we're, we're blowing them out at $25 minimum donation, which is a steal. Uh, they sell for $63, I believe, on some other website. And uh, we're, we're able to give them out for cheap. Uh, it also allows you to support our program and to, to publicly show your support, which is a really cool thing to do. This is the coolest thing going on. We are the rebels. We are the, the, the people that are uh, you know, fighting the, the government and, and doing what's right for, for the small man. And uh, so this is the coolest thing to get a, be a part of, and that's a great way to be a part of it. Uh, i got to thank also uh, the people at Cannabis Culture, Pot TV, my producer, Anil. 
uh, for allowing me this platform to be able to try to further my interests and our interests in our pursuit of freedom for ourselves and for those that want to use cannabis, but it's obviously a much bigger issue than that. And to the other people that also participate in cannabis culture and pot TV, uh, on Mondays we have Carly Marley and BC Bud Girl doing the 420 Lifestyle Show, and that's more fun than you can have on a pot TV show ever. And uh, on Thursdays, BC Bud Gal has recuperated enough from Mondays that she can wake and bake and help you wake and bake at, uh, for a morning glory show at uh, 10 a.m. Johnny B, the most important show we have going other than ours perhaps, is about how to grow weed and uh, how's it grown with uh, Johnny B is, uh, is a great way to learn uh, many new ways to grow. Uh, all growing is just practice. Uh, as soon as you start practicing, you'll start having fun. You'll start to realize the benefits of having a relationship with a living organism that is eventually going to feed you and, and provide medicine and entertainment and euphoria and all of those things and save you money. Growing is a very uh, valuable and important thing to do. It's also a great uh, form of activism that we should all grow as much as we can because we've uh, grown our way to this point and we want to continue to grow our way until we finally overgrow this system that wants to uh, monopolize and oppress and, uh, and exploit uh, and all of those things that cause so much of a mess in our society. Uh, this is how we can do it. Uh, on the other days off, uh, you can uh, stream other POT TV shows. There's a huge archive of all kinds of things. You can watch previous episodes of the THC show and get up to date on a lot of other things as well. We do talk about some other things, and there is some new stuff every week. Uh, for those of you that watch every week, it's a lot of repetition. I understand that. Uh, it's what we're doing. We're, we're fighting this fight, and this is how the battle goes. Uh, week after week, it seems, we're still in a fairly similar situation. But uh, one of these days that'll break and we'll have a whole bunch of new news and that should cause a whole bunch of other new news as well. And uh, thank you all for watching. I appreciate it very much. Uh, the world is about to get back to some sort of semi-normal. I hope we all do that uh, in positive ways and, and I hope we've all learned a lot over the last while. Uh, mostly what I hope we've learned is that anything can happen at any time. Life is fragile and, and life is very important. It's far too serious to take serious. Uh, love is the answer. It's the answer to most questions. It's the way to live your life. Be kind to yourself, to others, to your environment. Mostly, though, have as much fun as you can until I see you next week.